June 5, 2008. Found my slice of paradise up in the remote Boundary Waters canoe area, a little spot on the edge of a pristine lake, perfect for a self-sufficient man to make his home. Ex-Marine, names Wyatt. Spent too many years fighting other people's wars, figured I deserved some solitude. So I built a cabin, got myself set up, spent my days fishing, foraging, leaving the rat race behind. Started hearing the rumors around that fall. A couple campers gone missing, whispers in the nearest town about wolves out of season or maybe a bear gone rogue. I didn't put much stock in it. Figured folks get lost out in the wilderness sometimes. Accidents happen. Then I found the remains. It was Jed, another off-gridder with a cabin a few miles over. He'd been a grizzled old coot, kept to himself mostly, but we'd swap supplies and stories sometimes. His cabin looked like it had been exploded, logs torn apart, the whole place reeking of blood. Found what was left of Jed near the lake shore. It wasn't any animal attack I'd ever seen. His body was ripped to pieces, half-eaten, like something huge and ravenous had gotten hold of him. That's when the fear started gnawing at my gut. If it could do that to Jed, then none of us out here were safe. I started fortifying my cabin, keeping my rifle loaded at all times. Nights were the worst. Sleep came in snatches, every rustle of leaves setting my heart pounding. I'd lie there, listening to the unnatural silence of the woods, knowing something was out there watching. One night I saw it. Full moon painted the landscape silver, and I was chopping wood by the cabin when I caught movement from the tree lean. It stood silhouetted against the night, massive, even on two legs. Thick, coarse fur clung to its powerful frame, and its head was long, almost wolf-like, but the proportions were all wrong. Its glowing yellow eyes fixed on me, and a primal scream echoed through the night. I barely made it inside the cabin before it charged. The impact against the door rattled my bones, and I could hear its ragged breathing and guttural snarls right outside. I fired through the window, again and again, the roar of gunfire deafening in the small space. It roared in pain but didn't retreat. Seemed to get even more enraged. The siege lasted for what felt like hours. It tore at the walls, trying to claw its way in. Each thud and splintering of wood sent me scrambling further back into the cabin. Then, just as abruptly as it started, the noises stopped. An eerie silence settled over the clearing. I didn't sleep a wink that night, just waited with my rifle clenched and white-knuckled hands for the onslaught to resume. By morning... The only evidence of the creature was the ravaged ground around my cabin and the lingering coppery stench of blood. I knew right then I couldn't stay. Packed my essentials and abandoned everything else. Drove for hours without looking back, found a motel on the edge of civilization, and holed up there for a week. Every time the wind rustled the curtains, I jumped, half expecting to see those glowing eyes peering in at me. I couldn't shake the image of Jed's remains, the creature's monstrous form in the moonlight. Eventually, I forced myself to get moving again. I drift from city to city now, never staying too long. Call me paranoid, call me crazy, but that thing is still out there. I see it sometimes, in the shadows at the edge of my vision, lurking on deserted streets late at night. I hear its ragged breathing in the alleyways, smell its rotten stench carried on the wind. Folks in the Boundary Waters whisper stories about a Wendigo, a ravenous spirit from old lore. Maybe that's what it is, maybe it's something else entirely. All I know is that there are things in this world that don't fit into our understanding, things that lurk in the deepest shadows of the wild. And some of us, we see them, they mark us in a way folks who live safe within city walls can never comprehend.
I remember the radio crackling to life in the early hours, jolting me from sleep. Nicholas Berenger, we need you at base. A stern, commanding voice rang out. Missing hikers near Redwood National Park. I quickly dressed and set out in my truck towards the park. As I drove on the winding and deserted road, I couldn't help but feel an overbearing dread settle on me. Something wasn't right. Meeting with my team leader, Helena, she filled me in on the details of the four missing hikers. Their campsite was discovered abandoned, blood everywhere. The local authorities were baffled. We headed into the dense forest together in search of any leads. As hours turned into days, we found nothing but an eerie silence that enveloped us. Out of nowhere, Helena stumbled upon a shredded backpack, one of the missing hikers. Overwhelmed by curiosity, she reached inside and pulled out a mangled phone. To our horror, its cracked screen displayed a video of an enormous creature making its way through the woods like some sick mutation between human and animal. Reflexively dropping the phone onto blood-stained leaves underfoot, we knew we were dealing with something we couldn't handle alone. We decided to call Fry Mossingham, a seasoned biologist who had studied predators in remote regions for years. Fry arrived by helicopter two days later with his arsenal of equipment. He was captivated by our findings immediately. The three of us spent nights whispering theories around campfires as we tracked this mysterious creature. One day while hiking off trail, Fry caught sight of something horrifying, half-devoured remains dangling from tree branches above us. The overpowering stench was almost as unbearable as our sudden realization that this merciless monster didn't just kill, it terrorized its victims. Despite an overwhelming sense of dread bearing down on us like heavy fog, we couldn't leave the investigation to chance. As we ventured deeper into the woods, weird occurrences continued to mount, distorted howls in the night and gnarled symbols etched into tree bark, ominous messages that seemed to taunt us. The situation escalated one evening when we fell into a pit covered with tangled branches and leaves. Fending off unbearable pain and sheer panic, we managed to drag ourselves out of the hole. While observing our surroundings, Fry suggested that this trap might have been deliberately designed not just by some animalistic creature, but something intelligent. The realization was deeply unsettling. Both frightened and fascinated by our findings, we carried on researching. Tracking this enigmatic creature became an obsession as much as it was an obligation. Was it responsible for the disappearance of the hikers? Or were there more sinister forces at play? Fry assembled a collection of footprints and first samples that didn't quite add up. This creature had features of both primates and felines yet was unlike anything ever documented before. He hypothesized that its distant roars resembled a desperate plea for companionship, but any humor faded when darkness engulfed us each night. As the days passed, the pressure to understand this horrifying creature increased. We couldn't help but feel as if we were running out of time while trying to decipher its purpose. Susan suggested that we get in touch with an expert on unidentified and rare species— hoping that they could shed some light on our discovery. Fry reached out to a colleague, Dr. Maxwell Thompson, well-versed in studying such species, and briefed him on our situation. Dr. Thompson arrived at our campsite with a sense of urgency. He listened to our theories and descriptions of the creature, including the footprints and first samples that Fry had collected. We showed Dr. Thompson the gnarled symbols on the tree bark, and he informed us that they didn't seem to have any cultural significance he was aware of. Over time, it became clear that this creature wasn't acting like an ordinary predator. It was almost as if it delighted in the terror it inflicted upon its victims while craving something more than just sustenance. One night, as we hid from the creature beneath a camouflage tent hoping to stay unnoticed, Susan received a call from search and rescue authorities that more hikers had gone missing in these woods. 
fearful for their lives and feeling responsible for finding answers, we debated whether it was time to call for reinforcements and share what we'd discovered with them. However, Dr. Thompson pointed out that doing so would only put innocent lives at risk when nobody understood this creature's abilities or intentions yet. Instead, he proposed setting up cameras around the heavily frequented areas in case it targeted more hikers against whom we could gather additional evidence. For days, we monitored several cameras, witnessing horrifying scenes of this ruthless predator stalking and mauling innocent people like prey with its agile limbs and razor-sharp claws while blending into its surroundings like an expert hunter. One morning, while reviewing footage from the latest gruesome attack captured by the cameras, we noticed something chilling. It appeared as if the creature had momentarily stopped to study one of its victims up close before continuing its torment. Suddenly, it became clear that the creature was targeting us. Just as we came to this realization, pandemonium broke loose. Our campsite was attacked by the beast. In a panic, Fry yelled for us to run while he tried to hold it off with his flashlight, swinging wildly in an attempt to provide us with an escape route. Susan and I sprinted through the woods before splitting up, hoping that doing so would confuse the creature or reduce its chances of catching both of us. I could hear Susan's screams of panic echoing in the distance until they abruptly stopped. Petrified for my own life and unsure if Fry or Dr. Thompson had survived, I continued running, thinking of my family back home and how much they depended on me. I stumbled upon a ranger's cabin and took refuge inside without a second thought, locking its door behind me. Immediately, I dialed 911 and informed them of our desperate situation. They instructed me to remain inside until help arrived which felt like an eternity. When the authorities finally came accompanied by a SWAT team, they found Fry's lifeless, violently mauled body at our campsite but no sign of Susan or Dr. Thompson. The authorities launched an extensive search for the creature but to no avail. It seemed as if it had vanished into thin air. A few months passed and the terrifying events in those woods faded from memory as life went on. Authorities never recovered Susan's body nor found any traces of the creature. However, every now and then news reports speculated about inexplicable cases of people disappearing in remote regions. To this day, I cannot shake thoughts of that bone-chilling creature nor my friends with whom I ventured into those godforsaken woods. Their memories serve as a haunting reminder of the fateful encounter— and the incomprehensible evil that lurks in the shadows. I had just parked my car at the entrance of Edward Forest, excited because I had finally been able to get some days off to go hiking all by myself. My name is Aster Curie and I find that there is no better way to unwind than exploring the great outdoors. While locking my car, I caught a glimpse of another hiker preparing his backpack and adjusting his straps as if he was about to challenge me into a race. Hey, he called out. One would think you're the type who'd drink a full cup of coffee and not even offer any to other people on their way up. We both laughed before properly introducing ourselves. While deep in conversation with the other hiker named Thane Rousseau, we started venturing into Edward Forest. Admiring the landscape around us and taking in its beauty, we quickly lost track of time. The trees towered high above us, blocking most of the sunlight that attempted to filter through the branches. Insects buzzed around us as birds sang their melodious tunes from hidden perches. As Thane and I trekked further along the trail— we noticed deep claw marks etched into multiple trees surrounding us. Before we could give much thought to the strange markings, we found ourselves near an old abandoned cabin tucked away in a small clearing. Curiosity peaked. We decided to take a closer look. 
Outside the cabin's entrance lay a knot upon carcass with entrails spread out that neither Thane nor I could easily identify. It didn't look like anything done by animals native to this area. Hesitantly entering the cabin, we carefully tiptoed around broken glass and rotting wood planks that seemed ready to collapse at any second. Unsurprisingly, inside the cabin covered with dust and cobwebs, lay remnants of solemn life once lived in these woods. As we went deeper, Thane leaned forward to examine a yellowing piece of paper nailed to the wall. We weren't sure what it was referring to, but we felt an uneasy atmosphere for sure. As the day went on, Thane and I decided to camp out for the night near a small stream not too far from the cabin. We joked around, trying to lighten the eerie air we now found ourselves in. After roasting marshmallows over a crackling fire and sharing our favorite funny stories, we climbed into our tents as darkness consumed our surroundings. In the middle of the night, we heard rustling in the distance. Slowly waking up and peeking out of our tents, we saw an unfamiliar silhouette creeping through the dense forest towards us. It was much taller than any human or animal we had ever come across, with elongated limbs and a skeletal build. As it moved closer, we realized its head resembled that of a deer skull with sharp antlers sprouting from each side. This was no animal either of us had ever encountered before, but I remembered seeing something similar in a journal found inside the cabin, warning residents and visitors of something stalking through the woods. Gripped by fear but unwilling to sit there waiting for it to get nearer, Thane whispered urgently that we should flee as silently as possible. Neither one of us dared call for help because just one misstep might be enough for this otherworldly creature to catch us unawares. Stealthily, we packed our belongings and attempted to slip away from our campsite, but the sound of snapping twigs beneath our feet alerted whatever stalked us from a distance. Its pace quickened as its unearthly eyes locked onto ours, pursuing us relentlessly through Edward Forrest's treacherous terrain. We picked up the pace too with no time for hesitation or carelessness, purely focused on escaping from this nightmare that materialized out of nowhere. Thane shouted, I always get the last laugh on something funny, but today's leg day joke didn't exactly hit as I hoped. A remark that felt strangely reassuring, even in our dire situation. Our hearts raced as we continued running through the forest. We could hear it getting closer to us, its raspy breaths and heavy steps sending shivers down our spines. Each moment grew more intense as we tried to flee, making every effort not to trip or stumble. Inching our way through the underbrush, we knew that calling for help would only attract more attention to ourselves. The creature seemed to have a keen sense of hearing, and any noise could be the trigger that seals our fate. Instead, we relied on hand signals and occasional whispers, hoping to maintain enough distance between us and the creature. The forest was vast, but we knew there was a road on the other side if we could just reach it. That road represented our last chance to find help and maybe even survive this ordeal. We kept pushing through the thick foliage, every step feeling like it could be our last. At one point, we spotted a hiker in the distance. We wanted to call out to him, but the thought of attracting the creature's attention made us hesitate. Eventually, we decided against it and watched him disappear into the woods. Besides, Involving another innocent person in our brutal predicament felt wrong. As we continued on, Thane suggested breaking off tree branches and dropping them behind us in case someone found our campsite and decided to follow us. It was a desperate effort to leave some kind of trail without making too much noise. Suddenly, I felt a sharp pain in my leg as I tripped over a hidden tree root, instinctively letting out a gasp of pain. Panic set in as we heard the creature's footsteps rapidly closing in on us. Thane grabbed my arm and helped me up. There was no time for rest or apologies now. We sprinted as fast as our weary legs could carry us. 
We finally reached an opening in the woods where we saw the road in sight, just mere feet away from us. However, our momentary relief vanished when I heard Thane's desperate cry. He had stumbled and fallen behind me. Turning around to help my friend, I watched in horror as the creature reached out with its elongated limbs towards Thane. It was now or never. I couldn't leave him behind, but I also knew we couldn't fight this creature off. Run! Thane screamed, his voice filled with terror as the creature grabbed him. Seeing no other choice, I sprinted towards the road, my heart sinking as Thane's screams echoed in my ears. Reaching the road, I stumbled upon a passing car and desperately flagged it down. The driver was taken aback by my disheveled appearance but agreed to help and called the police. When they arrived at the scene, all that remained were Thane's tattered clothes and blood splatters on the forest floor. The mysterious creature had vanished without a trace. While I recounted our nightmarish ordeal to the authorities, I could only think of Thane, my friend who had sacrificed himself so that I might escape. In the weeks and months that followed, search parties turned up nothing, leaving more questions than answers. Eventually, the case went cold, a horrifying mystery forever etched in Edward Forrest's history. People speak of cautionary tales about venturing too deep into those woods now. Still, to me, it serves as a chilling reminder of the friend who bravely faced an unknown horror so that I could escape its grasp. Haunted by the memory of Thane's screams and knowing what became of him will weigh heavily on me for the rest of my life. Perhaps some creatures are best left undiscovered and forgotten in the hidden corners of our world. This happened to me a couple of years ago. You always think stuff like this happens to other people, right? On the news, in some made-for-TV movie with cheesy acting, not to you. Me, I'm Elroy, just a regular guy trying to survive the daily grind working construction. Pays the bills, puts a beer in my hand at the end of a long day. So whenever possible, I load up my RV and try to disappear for a while. Nature's good for the soul, you know? Anyway, the last summer this whole thing went down, I figured I'd head up the California coast. Beaches, mountains, all that good stuff. Plus, maybe some redwoods in the northern part of the state. Never seen those giants up close before. Seemed like a win-win, a way to clear my head and escape the crowds for a bit. The first few days were paradise. Found a sweet little spot along the coast right up on a cliff overlooking the ocean. Sunsets over the water, campfires on the beach, could get used to this kind of living. I even joked about quitting my job then and there. Things took a turn a few nights in. Not anything big at first, mind you. Just that feeling prickled the back of your neck, like you're being watched. I looked around, but it was pitch black, just me and the waves crashing below. I chalked it up to being overly tired, figured a good night's sleep would fix it. Next morning, though, things felt wrong. My campsite was a mess, not trashed, but small stuff out of place. I assumed it was the wind, it got strong near the cliff's edge. Still, couldn't shake the feeling I was missing something. So I ventured a little way down one of the hiking trails behind my site, not too far, just enough to explore a bit. That's when I found it. Maybe a hundred feet off the main trail, there was a pile of animal bones. Wasn't a carcass, like something had left its kill there. The bones looked scattered, almost arranged. In the center, stuck upright, was a skull. An animal skull, for sure, but way too big to be a coyote or deer. More like bear size or bigger. Something cold seeped through my veins. Whatever made that thing, it wasn't natural. I don't consider myself a religious guy, 
but I sure had an urge to pray right then. Instead, I bolted back to camp, packed up my stuff as fast as I could, and hit the road. But even while driving, I felt a gnawing dread I couldn't shake. A day later I'd found a new spot farther north. Figured if anything was back there on those old trails, it wasn't likely to follow. This time, I picked a more established campground near a national park. Thought safety in numbers was an idea, right? The first day or two passed without incident, and relief seeped through me. Maybe I really had overreacted back there. Then came my neighbor, die name of Arlo. Arlo didn't drive an RV, just an old station wagon with all his gear haphazardly crammed in. We got to talking as neighbors do. He seemed nice enough, little odd but harmless. Arlo was into photography, the serious kind, with massive lenses and all. Had come up here searching for the perfect landscape shot, he said. Kept going on about how nature held untold secrets. At the time, I just figured he was some artsy hippie and went about my day. Then came the incident that brought this whole nightmare to a head. I got to talking to the campground host, an old guy named Frank. Turned out this wasn't Arlo's first trip to the area. In fact, Frank recognized him from the year before. See, a week or so after Arlo's last visit, another couple disappeared from the park and were never found. The cops did some searching, said Bears probably got him, but nothing was ever proved. Frank thought something was fishy about Arlo, but with no evidence, just figured the guy was weird and moved on. After talking to Frank, that cold dread settled back in. What if he was right? What if Arlo had something to do with those people going missing? And now, here I was, his closest neighbor. That night, while pretending to sleep, I listened closely. Sure enough, a little past midnight, I heard movement outside. Saw the glow of his flashlight moving away from the campground and disappearing into the trees. He didn't return until right before dawn. I'd seen enough. That morning, I tossed the last of my gear into the RV without cleaning my sight. Didn't want to risk staying one second longer. When I went to tell Frank I was leaving, his cabin was empty. Arlo's car was gone too. A couple years back, I went on a road trip with Leon and Tamson. We wanted an adventure, something off the well-worn path. That's how we ended up in the Ozarks, a tangled sprawl of forests, lakes, and rugged terrain in southern Missouri. I always considered myself a city slicker, so the untouched wilderness was both overwhelming and exciting. Our initial plan was to camp our way through the area, hitting some of the less-traveled trails. The first night, though, it started pouring. Our gear wasn't holding up, and we wound up in a dusty little motel outside a one-stoplight town called Elkhart. You know the type diner on the highway, a few run-down houses, and a gas station with an unreadable hand-painted sign offering dubious snacks. The motel proprietor was a skeletal guy with thin hair and a permanent scowl etched on his face. We learned his name, Oren, as he shoved a key at us and pointed in the vague direction of our room. Next morning, over watery coffee and burnt toast at the diner, a local mentioned Devil's Creek Gorge. Said it was cursed by Native Americans, and no one in his right mind ventured down there. He gave us a wink and a little warning. Bad things happen in those woods, ya hear? Naturally, my friends were sold. Leon, who had this weird obsession with local legends, was buzzing with excitement. Tamson, with her nose always buried in some obscure history text, couldn't resist the pull of a place no one else wanted to venture near. I, on the other hand, was much less eager. 
Sure, a scenic hike sounded nice, but a cursed gorge? Nope. A lot of good that skepticism does you when you've got two reckless adventurers as friends. The path wasn't on any map, but we'd gotten directions at the diner and felt brave enough to find it. It started deceptively normal, a gentle slope downward through tall pines and oaks. But the further we went, the denser things got. A blanket of damp moss covered everything, and the sunlight had trouble breaking through the tangled, overgrown canopy of trees. The forest around us was unnaturally quiet, except for the rustling of our footsteps and the occasional snap of a twig. Leon started up with his endless repertoire of ghost stories, but honestly, his tales were nothing compared to the unsettling feeling of the place. My skin crawled, and the back of my neck prickled with that sense of being watched. Tamson, usually so dismissive of such things, had gone unusually quiet, eyes darting to every shadow. And then there was the smell. This faint, rotting sweetness in the air. At first, we tried to ignore it, blame it on the thick brush or some natural phenomenon, but it grew stronger the further and we went. After walking for what felt like hours, the ground dipped in a sharp decline toward a ravine shrouded in an almost perpetual twilight. At the bottom, there was a rushing creek. Not much of a sight in itself, but something about the murky water churned my stomach. We followed the creek downstream, keeping close and hoping that maybe this path would loop back toward the main road. We walked for a while before I froze. There was an impression in the soft earth. Massive, distorted. We'd heard tales of mountain lions and whatnot in the Ozarks, but this seemed too big. This ain't no cougar, Leon whispered, fear lacing his voice. Before we could make a decision about what to do, Tamson gasped. We turned and saw it, a hunched, hulking creature on the far side of the creek. It was enormous, at least seven feet tall, shrouded in dark, bristly fur. Even at that distance, it looked impossibly strong. Its enormous yellow eyes gleamed in the semi-darkness, fixed on us. My blood ran cold. Leon fumbled for his backpack, probably reaching for the pistol he thought he was being sneaky about bringing. My survival instincts were screaming at me to run, but it felt like my feet were rooted to the ground. The creature slowly advanced towards us, taking one massive stride after another across the creek. There was an animalistic intelligence in its movements, a terrifying focus. We bolted back the way we came, scrambling up the slippery bank with newfound desperation. I glanced back and saw it burst from the brush, gaining on us with unsettling speed. A tangle of roots brought Tamson crashing down, a sharp cry escaping her. Leon scrambled back, hauled her up. Her face was white. As we raced through the trees, I didn't dare look back again. But I still heard it thundering footsteps echoing through the undergrowth, snapping branches, and ragged snarls. Tamson twisted her ankle badly in the frantic dash, making our desperate retreat a slow and horrifying ordeal. My throat burned with every ragged breath, the panic pushing me through the thick, claustrophobic branches and undergrowth. I stared at the graffiti on the late-night subway, trying to decipher its hidden message. As it turned out, dry humor and nutty colleagues were my relief after a mundane workday at the gaming studio. I'm Joe Nahimana, a game developer hailing from a Native American background. With family roots in the Kiowa tribe, I always had this nostalgic longing to revisit our ancestral land in Oklahoma. One summer night, my wish came true when my brother Elliot and I journeyed to visit our uncles on the Kiowa tribal reservation near Anadarko. 
This trip not only rekindled our connection with our roots, but also led us into an unforeseen encounter with a creature that haunts me to this very day. On our first evening at the reservation, Uncle Charles shared his concerns over recent disappearances of locals sparked by an unseen terror lurking deep within the woods. As we sat around the campfire, he narrated folklore about a grotesque beast preying on people for decades. Elliot and I shrugged off those eerie tales, dismissing them as old myths meant to scare kids into obedience. We continued exploring the grasslands and woods of our heritage before heading back to camp for dinner with Uncle Charles and Aunt Emma. Desiring to capture the beauty of our tribe's land at sunset, I ventured out near Red Rock Canyon State Park with Elliot trailing behind me. My eyes captured the vibrant palette of sunset hues reflected on the canyon walls as Elliot scoured rocks for artifacts left by ancestors. Enthusiastically breaking off from me, Elliot called out my name to show his findings, a spectacular arrowhead carved with intricate detail engraved on its surface. Eyes widened in awe, we approached the canyon's edge to get a better view of our surroundings. Dusk settled in ominously as we heard faint cries echoing through the canyon's labyrinthine walls. Maybe somebody needs help, I urged Elliot, and we decided to venture further to locate the source of those sounds. As we walked deeper into the canyon, guided only by feeble moonlight, we sensed that things were taking a turn for the worse. The faint cries grew louder with every step morphing into grunts and growls that sent chills down our spines. Logic and curiosity battled within us as we continued onward. A bone-chilling scream shrieked through the air, dragging us out of trepidation. Fear gripping our hearts now, Elliot and I hesitated before deciding to push forward, convinced someone was in trouble. We turned a corner to find a blood-curdling scene. Shredded fleshy bits scattered on crimson-drenched rocks while traces of unfamiliar tracks led back into the darkness. Horrified beyond measure at this gruesome sight, it was clear someone had met their gruesome demise here. A fear like never before loomed over me as visions of Uncle Charles's beast resurfaced in my mind. Panic surged through me, and I yelled at Elliot to retreat immediately. We sprinted back towards camp with pulsating hearts as muffled beats ominously drew closer. Our breaths came in ragged gasps as we stumbled back toward our camp, urgently casting glances behind us at the fading screams and the inescapable feeling of being pursued. The once faint cries that beckoned us into the depths of the canyon now haunted us as an unseen horror loomed dangerously close. The frayed nerves and exhaustion hastened our collapse onto camp beds. Too terrified to sleep, we barely spoke, each sentence laced with silent terror. Desperate to find help, we searched our pockets for phones, but found they had been left behind in the earlier chaos. Our isolation and inability to call for help hung heavily in the air. While huddled together around a meager fire, we heard footsteps approaching cautiously. Elliot breathed a weak sigh of relief upon recognizing his Uncle Charles's familiar face in the flickering light. His eyes revealed shock and fear as we told him what happened, the cries, the gruesome scene, the beast. Uncle Charles's voice trembled with unspoken horror, suggesting that camping in such proximity to fallen hikers was ill-advised. He proposed to escort us down from the canyon first thing next morning. Sleep arrived fitfully that night. Nightmares of a towering vicious beast dominated our dreams. The howl of wind and restless branches mimicked eerie cries for help until dawn finally broke through restless darkness. Gripping Uncle Charles's offered hand for support, we trudged down from those cursed cliffs with all haste before pausing momentarily at its base. Knots formed within our stomachs as we glanced up, suspecting a sinister presence lurking somewhere nearby among those jagged edges. Within days after revelation of the fallen hiker's gruesome end, 
local authorities swarmed the canyon like scavengers around a carcass. While their investigations couldn't pinpoint a perpetrator, evidence alluded to a brutal wild animal as prime suspect. As authorities dug deeper, they discovered a bristling nightmare lurking in the canyon's shadows. A monstrous creature, bipedal and bear-like, with impossibly long limbs ending in sharp claws capable of shredding through flesh as if it were mere silk. Photographs revealed snarling features from the few who had caught its distorted visage amidst shadows. Grand speeches alluded to a fearsome, elusive predator, monstrous in size and strength. As explanations grew, so too did whispers of more grisly findings. Scattered remains unearthed deep within the canyon bearing gouges inflicted by razor-sharp talons similar to those witnessed on luckier victims. While the authorities sought a way to capture or perhaps kill this marauding monster, life turned upside down at the base of that cursed canyon. Families pressed against boarded windows, hoping desperately that barriers erected at night could withstand such a ferocious blow from that mysterious beast. Days rolled into weeks with neither solace nor solution appearing on the horizon. Panic spread like wildfire among locals. Whispers of hastily packed belongings and unannounced departures echoed throughout town. Though we yearned to leave this waking nightmare behind us, Uncle Charles remained firm in his resolve to stay. Much of his identity rested upon the canyon's cragged ledges. It anchored him to this place as strongly as any steel cable might. He obsessed over seeing the creature brought to justice before overtaken by defeat in a home plagued by unease following that dreadful night. As weeks bled into months, public focus shifted begrudgingly toward distant issues tormenting our tired world. The monstrous harbinger of death stalking canyon shadows retreated into obscurity. The creature had vanished as though never existed, swallowed by labyrinthine walls once teeming with life and laughter. With no end in sight for this gruesome tale haunting humanity's fragile existence within ancient stone walls, no lasting solace emerged for those whose lives had been upended without warning. Fearful whispers of the creature's return enveloped tired minds who defied the creeping dark to see another day. In a world cursed with unanswered questions plagued by the weight of chilling memories, we find brief respite only through hope in a tomorrow free from the beast's blood-soaked rain, or perhaps through acceptance that even the most terrifying mysteries among us must stand as testament to nature's heart-wrenching and inexplicable brutality. I've always felt a connection to nature, especially in the dense forest near the small town of Woodboro, Pennsylvania. My name is Arlen Sinclair, and I work for a covert task force assigned to hunting and tracking monsters. My team and I were on a secret mission when one day, something unimaginable happened to me. I was walking through the woods along with my colleagues Conway Rogers and Vesta Drummond, we were among tall trees with branches intertwined like braided hair, overshadowing our path. We had credible reports of strange occurrences over the past few months in this area. Missing persons, unexplained animal attacks, and eerie noises echoing at night. Our mission was to investigate these incidents and find their cause. As we progressed deeper into the forest, we found marks on some trees— long scratch marks, that weren't the work of any wild animal we knew of. After a long day's trek, kinks in our muscles and fatigue settling in as we set up camp for the night. It wasn't long before all three of us were asleep around the crackling fire. The forest was eerily quiet that night when suddenly it was broken by what seemed like a distant scream for help. Vesta shot up from her sleep and looked around for any sign of what might be causing that unsettling noise. We quickly gathered ourselves, knowing every minute could save a life. This is how it works in our line of duty danger lurks around every corner, 
and fear is as much a part of our lives as breathing. The pressure might make an average person buckle, but not us. We chose this path to protect people from things they couldn't understand or accept. As we followed those screams down dimly lit forest paths, thick underbrush clutching at our boots like desperate hands grasping for help, we entered a clearing where we discovered something no one could ever be prepared for. A creature stood before us, a monstrous being unlike anything we had ever encountered. The beast was approximately seven feet tall, covered in reddish-brown fur, with piercing yellow eyes that glowed like embers about to ignite. Its snout was wet with what appeared to be blood, and its long, razor-sharp claws were stained a deep shade of crimson. People's lives had been rent to shreds by these formidable talons. This animalistic monster stood on two legs like a demented mockery of human anatomy. The atmosphere suddenly grew dense with tension as the realization sunk in. We were facing an unknown and terrifying enemy that easily killed and maimed without remorse. We couldn't allow this beast to keep terrorizing innocent people, so we prepared to face it head-on. Grasping our guns tightly, we advanced cautiously, ready to take action. There was a determination in each of us to protect those who could not protect themselves from this heinous threat. But the creature was fast and strong, evading our bullets as it darted between trees and leaped clear over logs. Realizing projectiles would have limited effect against such a creature, I opted for my knife instead. As I confronted the beast and prepared to make my move, Conway quipped, I wasn't expecting to play in an action movie today. For a second, just a brief moment, laughter threatened to replace the tension choking our throats. But it didn't last long as the creature came back into focus. I sprang forward, lashing out at the creature with my knife while dodging its strikes. It was a dance of death between predator and protector as the battle unfolded before our eyes. Conway positioned himself behind the monster attempting to provide cover fire as I continued my duel with it. Vesta took up position beside him. As we battled the monstrous creature, it became apparent that our close-knit teamwork would be put to the test. Bullets was passed from Conway and Vesta's position, grazing the creature's mottled skin and sending blood spattering onto the foliage. Yet, despite our valiant efforts, this terrifying beast remained relentless in its relentless pursuit. It lunged forward, catching me off guard and nearly tearing through my flesh with those horrifying claws. I narrowly dodged it, sidestepping and slashing with my knife. Aim for its eyes! I shouted at Conway and Vesta, hoping they'd have better luck at incapacitating the creature. The monster snarled in response thrashing around in rage. It charged at me again, but this time Vesta managed to shoot one of its eyes, causing it to screech in pain and momentarily retreat. Get back, everyone! I yelled as we retreated towards our temporary hideout. We needed a plan. Going head-to-head -head against this creature was futile. Our lives were at stake here. Our phones had no signal in this hellish forest making calling for help impossible. We also didn't have enough time to leave the area to get help since the lives of innocents were in danger. Their blood stained the ground as a constant reminder of what would happen if we failed. We realized that if we could trap the creature, we might stand a chance of immobilizing it long enough to severely wound or kill it. After discussing our plan, we decided to use one of the larger logs nearby as a makeshift lever to trap its leg or torso beneath it. With great effort, we managed to prepare our trap. But now came the hardest part, baiting the creature into it without getting killed in the process. I volunteered for this task and carefully approached the spot where we last saw our enemy. As soon as I was close enough, it leaped at me again. I maneuvered and screamed for my comrades to pull the lever. As they did, the log fell onto the creature, 
its bulk knocking it off balance. Unfortunately, it wasn't enough to trap or crush the beast. A powerful swipe from its remaining claws sent the log flying into a nearby tree trunk. The moment's distraction was all I needed, however. Darting forward with my knife outstretched, I slashed at its other eye, plunging it into temporary darkness. The creature's howls of pain echoed through the forest as it swung around violently, trying to locate us despite its blinded state. Taking the opportunity presented to us, we executed our original plan, working together to bring this monster down. As Conway and Vesta fired bullet after bullet into the monstrous creature, I aimed with precision at its critical areas, including the gaping wound where one of its eyes used to be. Eventually, after what felt like hours of battling this nightmarish foe, our combined efforts paid off. The creature collapsed loudly onto the ground with one final agonizing scream. Exhausted and panting heavily, we marveled at our victory. The terrifying beast that had been hunting down and killing innocent people lay motionless before us. Tears welled in my eyes as I remembered those who fell victim to this horrifying creature, their lives stolen too soon by something no one could have anticipated. We could only guess what kind of species this thing was. Our emotions swirled as we realized how close we had come to our death at the hands of this inexplicable entity. With both relief and sadness in our hearts, we left that accursed forest behind to get others involved in resolving what was left of this nightmare. We reported our encounter with the authorities after finally getting a signal on our phones. Though we were met initially with skepticism due to the bizarre nature of our tale, the evidence we provided was enough to convince them of the reality of our story. In the end, we learned that sometimes the most unexpected and gruesome dangers can make their way into our lives. And on that day, we overcame one such horror and saved countless others from suffering the same fate as those before them. It was a victory over evil, yes, but it was also a somber reminder that darkness still lurked in the corners of this world. And we must remain ever vigilant to keep it at bay. This happened to me several years ago. My name is Alaric Bouchard, a former detective searching for answers. I had retreated to a cabin deep in the Chugash State Park, Alaska after losing my faith in the justice system. The remote, off-the-grid location felt perfect for clearing my mind and deciding my future. My only human contact was Bud Hartnett, the nearest neighbor living several miles away. Despite our uncommon names, we never discussed them or considered them special. Bud's visits were few and far between, as he preferred solitude much like myself. One day, while chopping wood outside my cabin, I felt an inexplicable gut feeling something wasn't right. Shrugging it off as paranoia from reading too many crime novels during my downtime, I continued with my chores. Returning to the cabin at dusk, something caught my eye in the distance. A swift movement suggesting an animal larger than what I was accustomed to seeing in these parts. Curiosity piqued. I retrieved binoculars from inside and scanned the area thoroughly but found nothing. Later that night while sitting by the fireplace, an incessant howling unsettled my normally calm demeanor. Deciding against contacting Bud for confirmation about unusual local wildlife incidents, I didn't want to disturb him or sound foolish. Over the next week, gruesome discoveries surfaced nearby, blood-soaked ground and trails suggesting struggle but no sign of bodies or discernible evidence about what caused them. A palpable tension crept through the woods once comforting embrace. Feeling trapped with no communication other than unreliable walkie-talkies that worked sporadically in this rugged landscape, I decided it was time to investigate further. 
but not before sharing a laugh with Bud over an old comedy show crackling through both ends of our walkies. Strapping on boots and grabbing a flashlight, I embarked on a dire search for answers in the chilling air of an Alaska night. The deeper I plunged into the dense forest, the more my sense of unease intensified. My skepticism dissolved with each unnerving detail uncovered. Finally, I stumbled upon a gruesome find, gnawed bones strewn about in a grisly circle around charred wood reminiscent of a mutilated bonfire ceremony. Dumbfounded, I'd processed the ghastly scene's implications when a monstrous creature burst from the shadows. Covered in scarred flesh and snarling with sharp teeth that had once torn through its human victims, the beast lunged for me. Instincts kicked in as I dodged to one side, narrowly avoiding its savage onslaught, realizing that retreat was my only chance of survival. Desperately sprinting through the moonlit woods, hearing guttural screams and shuffling foliage steps behind me, things like drug deals gone wrong or a diehard serial killer seemed mundane in comparison. A harrowing chase ensued. Branches tore at my clothes while I scrambled to escape the creature's terrifying pursuit. Despite our previous affinity for solitude and avoidance of weapons, today I cursed myself for not owning a gun or any means of defense. In this dire moment, hope flickered as my cabin's feigned outline appeared through a thicket. Teeth clenched tight and heart pounding within my chest— I forced one last surge of energy to escape this nightmare alive. With no time to spare, I flew open the door of my cabin, slammed it shut behind me, and locked it as fast as I could. My trusty landline phone sat on the kitchen counter, and I quickly dialed the local police station. Panting from exertion and fear, I tried to explain what had happened. The operator's confusion did not help to calm my nerves. Just stay inside, sir. We will send an officer over to investigate, the operator instructed before hanging up. Waiting for the police to arrive seemed like an eternity. The night outside was filled with terrifying sounds, howls echoing through the forest and claws scraping against the bark of trees. When two officers finally arrived at my cabin, I recounted my harrowing tale in hurried breaths while they listened intently but skeptically. Their initial assumption was that a violent animal might have attacked someone in the woods earlier and mistakenly targeted me as well. The officers searched around my property and discovered large paw prints leading away from my cabin into the dense forest but their further attempts to follow those tracks were met with a thick fog descending upon the area, making it difficult to see even a few feet ahead. I can't believe we're dealing with this in real life. One officer muttered nervously as they studied their surroundings, shivering from unease rather than cold. The other officer scratched his head, furrowing his eyebrows in frustration. It's strange how some kind of monstrous creature could live among us without being detected. This isn't something you read in those sci-fi novels. They decided it would be best to alert officials about a potential new threat in the woods rather than pursue what they couldn't track or identify anymore, at least not without backup or more equipment. The officers suggested I stay with family or friends until safety measures were put into place around my cabin which I wholeheartedly agreed to do since staying alone felt too risky. Days passed, and my life had all but ground to a halt. I temporarily moved in with my brother, as I'm too afraid to live in my cabin now. My fears spiraled into frustration and anger that this mysterious, bloodthirsty creature was still out there. The police and wildlife management conducted a thorough search of the woods, finding more mutilated carcasses of local animals. They theorized that the creature either had a den nearby or was using the woods as its hunting ground. Soon enough, local news channels picked up on the story, dubbing the malevolent being the Forest Butcher. 
conversations around town were dominated by speculation about what the creature could be, and some even joked it must be a mythical skinwalker or shapeshifter. For me, however, terror still hung heavy in the air. The gruesomeness of what I had witnessed left sleep difficult to come by despite my brother's spare room feeling safe and secure. At night, I stayed awake listening for unusual sounds outside his house, a growl, rustling leaves, or snapping of branches that may herald the approach of the fabled monster. Still terrified but determined to make sense of what happened that night, I did some research on my own without tapping into folklore or paranormal subjects. Instead, I tried to find information on undiscovered species of mutative animals or recorded cases of creatures with similar features and behaviors that might explain what it was that assaulted me. Nothing conclusive emerged from my search other than theories about practically impossible animal hybridization or extraordinarily large specimens of known predators. Further meetings with law enforcement and wildlife management officials remained inconclusive as well. By now public interest in the forest butcher began to weigh in as weeks passed since my encounter. Nervous whispers turned into vivid folklore told around campfires by those who sought more entertainment rather than any answers. No apprehended suspect or captured animal satisfied the public's momentary and morbid curiosity. However, I can't forget what I saw that night. The horrifying image of the monstrous creature with its scarred flesh and relentless pursuit haunted my waking hours. My life had irrevocably changed. And while I never found out what it was that attacked me, it went back into hiding, like a legend waiting to resurface when least expected. In my pursuit of answers and closure, one question remained, are we ready for the day when the forest butcher reemerges from the shadows? This happened to me a few summers ago. I'm Dave Briggs, a pretty average software engineer who loves hiking in my free time. Never had any unusual or frightening encounters until that fateful day. My journey began at Spruce Knob, West Virginia, the highest peak in the Allegheny Mountains. The air was crisp and the trails winding through tall pines provided great sightseeing. I planned for a two-day hike through the lush evergreen forests and dense fern-filled valleys. On my first day, after a few hours on the trail... I stumbled upon an unsettling scene, a bloodied backpack discarded among rocks and what looked like torn clothing scraps. My curiosity turned to apprehension as thoughts of injured hikers rushed into my head. I decided to seek help immediately. I reached for my phone but realized there was no signal. With urgency mounting, I hastened my steps and picked up the pace towards the nearest ranger station. As darkness fell, I entered a dense forest where the pines blocked out most of the light. A chilling wind rustled the needles above while distant animal calls echoed through the trees. Tension filled me with each sound in the eerie silence. It wasn't long before I heard something that made me stop dead in my tracks. Unmistakable human screams echoing from deep within the woods. Despite feeling paralyzed with fear... I knew I had to investigate. The source of the cries led me off trail and deeper into blackness of nightfall, until finally discovering their source. A horrifying scene unfolded before my eyes three monstrous figures hunched over the torn body of a man whose terrified face was contorted in agony. Frozen with terror as I observed their grotesque feast from behind a tree trunk, I saw them clearly for the first time. These were not ordinary men but some sort of twisted mutant cannibals all were muscular giants with matted hair and overgrown facial features, their teeth sharpened to points, and their fingers elongated, tipped with claws. As the chilling reality of my situation sunk in, urgency replaced fear. 
I decided it was time to summon the courage to escape before they noticed my presence. I slowly retreated, careful not to make a sound, adrenaline coursing through me like a torrent. This was no longer a simple hike but a desperate race for survival. If only I had someone to help me I wished desperately for the comforting presence of my best friend Kelly, who regrettably had declined my invitation due to an important work deadline. I knew reaching the nearest ranger station was crucial. The forest around me felt alive every rustle and distant animal call set my heart racing. Despite seemingly endless hours evading these bizarre murderous beings, though still under the cloak of darkness, I finally glimpsed light a dull ember glow carrying faint hope among the shadows. As I drew closer to what appeared to be a flickering campfire, feelings of relief mingled cautiously with dread. Fires usually meant people but could they be trusted? Only one way to find out. I approached cautiously from downwind, attempting to gather intelligence on the inhabitants before revealing myself. Soft voices murmured just beyond the circle of light cast from glowing coals within a small fire pit. Peering through gaps in foliage, I discerned four figures huddled around the dying embers all seemingly ordinary humans dressed in rugged outdoor attire, completely unaware of both my presence and lurking danger nearby. My initial instinct was to announce myself boldly and beg assistance. Nevertheless, caution prevailed for all I knew these newcomers could have sinister connections to my monstrous pursuers. Their conversation turned lighthearted as someone shared what sounded like an absurd joke. Why was six afraid of seven? Because seven, eight, nine. Despite overwhelming terror gripping me moments earlier, a brief chuckle bubbled up through my inner panic. I decided that these hikers must be friendly, and I stepped out of my hiding place to approach them with a mix of desperation and hope. As I did, a sudden rush of movement caught my eye, sending a fresh surge of terror through my veins. The monstrous giants were upon us, stalking ominously from the shadows. Panicked, I opened my mouth to shout an urgent warning, but just as quickly froze for one among the cannibals raised what appeared to be a hunting rifle slowly to its shoulder, gleaming muzzle now pointing directly at me. My body stiffened, paralyzed with fear, as the cannibal aimed the rifle at me. The peaceful atmosphere around the campfire evaporated within seconds. The hikers turned their heads in my direction and two of them gasped at the sight of my pursuers emerging from the darkness. Run! I screamed at them, keeping my eyes locked on the rifle-wielding giant. The hikers reacted quickly, scrambling to their feet and fleeing in all directions. The monstrous beings followed them, those who were unarmed giving chase while the one with the rifle kept its weapon aimed at me. As it neared I saw that this brute was covered in filth and tattered clothing, an unkempt beard covering much of its face. In that split second when I knew that both I and the hikers were in mortal danger, something boiled up from within me a primal desire to survive at all costs. As fearful as I was of the monstrosities before me, I resolved not to die without a fight. I picked up a hefty branch from the ground and lunged at the giant with the rifle. The ensuing chaos was a blur. My memory is fragmented by adrenaline and terror, vague recollections of shrill screams and desperate shouts, of limbs flailing and branches cracking. But one image remains seared into my mind, the horrors etched upon the faces of these monstrous men as they descended upon us like wolves upon sheep. The confrontation concluded as suddenly as it had begun. I found myself sprawled on muddy ground, every muscle in my body throbbing with pain. Crawling towards a nearby tree, I tried catching my breath. Amidst my confusion and exhaustion, one thing was clear had to find help. Muddy and wounded but alive, I ran through tangled woods without pause or thought for exhaustion or danger. Soon enough, 
though it felt like an eternity, I stumbled upon a dirt road, with tire tracks imprinted in the wet mud. I cried out in desperate relief. As luck would have it, just around the bend came a ranger's vehicle. Halting near me, the ranger helpfully exited his truck and supported my efforts to stumble toward him. What happened to you? he asked, as I collapsed into the passenger seat. The others, I gasped, before explaining as much of my ordeal as I could. The ranger, who introduced himself as Officer Simmons, listened grimly to my account before advising me to rest while he contacted his colleagues for assistance. By the time we returned to the campsite with reinforcements, dusk had fallen and an eerie silence hung over the area. Shivering with cold and terror despite a warm thermal blanket wrapped around my shoulders, I watched as officers scoured the scene for any signs of life or evidence of our attackers. They found nothing. As they loaded me into an ambulance, I glanced back at the desolation and knew no trace of the terrible events that had transpired remained. No cries for help or screams of agony could penetrate that stillness. My heart mourned for those hikers who had tried to save themselves but met a gruesome end instead. Days passed and police questioned me about every detail of what had happened that awful night. They came no closer to finding those responsible, nor did they uncover any further clue as to their motivation or origin. Despite this seeming lack of progress, authorities assured me they would continue to investigate and do their utmost to bring these inhuman beings to justice. If there was one small piece of comfort in this entire nightmare, it was knowing those brave officers were unwavering in their dedication to hunting down these sinister beings before they could threaten any more innocent lives. My thoughts often drifted back to that ill-fated night and the strange group of hikers around the campfire who found themselves caught in the crossfire between bloodthirsty mountain men and terror filled me. Perhaps I will never know the fates that awaited them, but I am forever grateful that despite their own fears, they attempted to save a stranger like me. I have to wonder, though, had my attackers been human, would they have shown us any mercy? This happened to me five years ago in the dense woods of Oregon. My name is Alaric Bouchard, and I was working as a forest ranger with four other co-workers. Our days consisted of regular duties like keeping the area clean, helping out lost hikers, and taking care of any emergencies that arose. During an early morning patrol, we noticed that the normally bustling campground was completely deserted. The tents were left open and personal belongings scattered around. Only the early morning birdsong was present in a place where laughter and whispers were usually punctuating the air. As we assessed the scene, our radios crackled to life with a message from Rinaldo Virial, another ranger on our team. He reported that something odd had been spotted in the woods near one of the hiking trails a trail riddled with claw marks alongside deep gouges from various wild animals. Despite initial skepticism among us, underutilizing caution seemed like a miscalculated risk given the bizarre sightings and recent disappearances of two hikers whose bodies turned up mutilated. Days before, they were discovered mere miles from our current location. Raina Cornelius who hailed from a small town in Idaho known for its mythical creature lore, unexpectedly chimed in. Her experience had attracted an ear for scrolling through details that comprised nightmarish hunts turned tragedies. Before splitting into groups to gather clues about the human absence spread across several acres of campsite, Raina quipped humorously about her siblings parking her car overnight at their shared childhood home and how she wished she could handle this situation with equal finesse. As my partner Kristen Holloway and I reached our designated area, I noticed something hidden behind trees, 
A human arm riddled with gashes lay detached under a bush, a gruesome detail withheld during the preliminary search carried out by Reina's group earlier. Kristen stumbled upon half-eaten remains nearby. Animal prints led away from the disarray in a still-wet trail that seemed to weave deliberately. Though wildlife was prevalent in the area, our training ruled out this type of predation in the region, a notion that was also confirmed by our decades of forest ranger experience combined. Utilizing our handheld walkie-talkies, we informed our team of the discovery and reiterated the tangent, bearing locations so others would take note. After pooling our findings and waiting for dust to darken, we sought guidance from experts like zoologists before developing appropriate action strategies. All advice corroborated a decision based on marking surrounding territory with sensors and warning signs, discreetly placed to acknowledge an aggressor while not providing enough ground to incite a challenge or cause unnecessary alarm. As we laid out traps with carefully measured bait, our casual banter turned into more serious contemplation. Rinaldo humorously questioned if whoever, or whatever, annihilated all these hikers would prefer veggies over caraway seeds for baiting purposes. The next morning took an ominous turn when we realized that Raina didn't show up at our meeting spot. We attempted to contact her through radio signals, but a convoluting static met unresponsive ears. Definitely not like Reina who exhibited punctuality as her prime mantle even in seasons deemed laxer. Frantic worry began entwining with growing suspicion. Could whatever plague these woods prove sinister enough to have targeted Reina too? Had it anticipated our interventions within its environment and retaliated? Having scouted her assignment area, near where Rinaldo first found abnormal trails— I noticed signs of struggle. Trampled ferns hinted at a chilling outcome. Reina's tool set lay strewn on trembling ground where her footprints vanished entirely. Rinaldo's nervous joke from earlier evening crackled back as we approached one gaping crevice alongside which whisked trails appeared eerie with dried blood specks immersed into liquid dirt. Our nerves were on edge, my mind raced with possibilities as Rinaldo and I decided to call for help. We tried contacting the headquarters over the radio, but we were met with an eerie silence. It was as if someone or something didn't want us to communicate with the outside world. As Rinaldo and I continued our search for Reina, we came across mutilated carcasses of small animals, rabbits and squirrels, seemingly ripped apart with brute force. It was clear that whatever creature was responsible had incredible strength and a ferocious nature. While moving through the woods, we noticed a series of deep gashes on trees, marks that were consistent with claws of some sort. Whatever it was seemed to be marking its territory or perhaps leading us further into its domain. As we ventured deeper into the forest, Following the gory trail, our surroundings grew darker and more oppressive. Though logically this change in atmosphere could be attributed to dense tree growth affecting the light, it felt as though something more sinister was at play here. We eventually spotted a large cave entrance hidden away off the path. Rinaldo and I shared a look of apprehension before deciding this is where we would find Reina. Our worst fears seemed to come true when we found torn fabric from Reina's jacket and tangled roots just outside the cave. Cautiously, we entered the cave's depths, armed with flashlights and concerned glances exchanged between us. The walls of the cave were marked with long scratch marks similar to those found on the trees outside, a troubling sign that our adversary now lurked within these shadows. After carefully scanning each cavernous chamber, our flashlights finally fell upon what appeared to be a massive nest made from foliage and animal remains. In the midst of it all lay a grotesque amalgamation of human remains, evidence that hikers hadn't been its only victims. Though age and decay made it impossible to identify the victims by their faces, we knew deep down that Reina was among them. 
My eyes welled up with tears, but I pushed my grief aside. It was now our goal to survive and escape this cave. I darted around the dark cave for impending danger, and a sudden realization struck me. If the creature that had killed so many was in fact nesting here, we were likely not alone. Just as the thought crossed my mind, a guttural growl echoed through the cave followed by a series of scraping sounds against stone. Rinaldo and I sprang into action. The urgency for self-preservation drowned out any thoughts of seeking answers as we sprinted towards the cave's entrance. The growls grew louder and closer as if the creature chasing us relished in our panic. Almost at the entrance of the cave, I managed to steal a fleeting glimpse of our pursuer through my peripheral vision. My heart raced as I took in its horrifying visage. It was bipedal but hunched over and covered in matted fur, with long forelimbs tipped with razor-sharp claws. Its face had a canine-like snout filled with jagged teeth, and its eyes held a gleaming malice behind their yellow glare. We burst from the cave into daylight with adrenaline pumping through our veins. Knowing that we were still on dangerous ground, we didn't stop running until we couldn't hear its terrifying footfalls behind us any longer. Once finally certain it had stopped chasing us, Rinaldo and I collapsed onto the ground, exhausted but grateful to be alive. Though fear still gripped us both, we knew we had to report what had happened to Reina and what dwelled within those cursed woods. With heavy hearts, we made our way back to civilization, haunted by memories of fallen comrades and chilling encounters. The following days were filled with investigations and disbelief as we recounted our experiences to authorities. Though a search was conducted, the creature's lair proved impossible for others to find perhaps by design or simple dark luck. While I wish I could say we put an end to the grisly mystery, whatever beast that had made those woods its home remained elusive. As for me, I carry forth memories of fallen friends and disturbing truths hidden within that dark cave. A somber reminder that there are still mysteries left in this world best left uncontested. And so Reina and her unnamed fellow victims remain forever intertwined with the sinister enigma lurking in those treacherous woods. I had just finished my lunch and was heading back to the station when the call came in. Officer Ben Delaney here, I said in response to the dispatcher. Ben, we've got a possible situation out at the old Jenkins farm. The owner reported some strange noises last night, and this morning found some livestock mutilated. Can you check it out? Not a problem. I'll head over now, I replied. The old Jenkins farm was out at the edge of Cedar Run, a small town in Nevada where I worked as a cop for the past decade. It wasn't too far from the station, so within twenty minutes, I found myself pulling up to the large, dilapidated farmhouse. A tall man in well-worn work clothes emerged from the house as I stepped out of my squad car. "'You must be Mr. Jenkins,' I said. "'Yes, sir, that's me, Dave Jenkins. Thanks for coming so quickly. It's not like anything I ever seen before,' he replied." his voice tinged with anxiety. Together, we walked to the barn where he had discovered three of his cows gruesomely mutilated, definitely not a job by any ordinary predator. What on earth could have done this? Dave asked, his voice barely above a whisper. I'm not entirely sure, I admitted truthfully. I called for additional officers and animal control to help me search for any other possible casualties or signs of what might have caused such devastation. While waiting for them to arrive, Dave mentioned that several people had gone missing recently around town, all in the same general area near the old Miller Creek Bridge. At that moment, my superior arrived along with others, so we split up and started our search. 
armed with flashlights and firearms at the ready, we cautiously combed through Dave's property. It wasn't long before I stumbled upon something that made my stomach churn, a shredded human shoe and a pool of blood near the edge of the woods. Gripping my gun tightly, I motioned for my fellow officers to follow me. The closer we edged towards the woods, the more uneasy I began to feel. It was unsettling, like someone or something was watching us. My gut told me that whatever was responsible for all this terror couldn't be far off. We didn't have to search long before we were greeted by the sounds of panic screams. Racing towards the sound, we found Kelly Thompson, one of our fellow officers, lying on the ground with her arm mangled, and above her stood a creature unlike anything we had ever seen. I now understood Dave's earlier words. We weren't dealing with any ordinary predator. This thing resembled something straight out of my worst nightmares. Its eyes burned with fury and malice. Its long, muscular limbs and agitated stance conveyed its intentions clearly. We opened fire in an attempt to subdue it, but our bullets seemed to do nothing more than aggravate it even further. In retaliation, it swung a massive talon-laced appendage at us, narrowly missing us and leaving a gaping hole in a nearby tree trunk. Run! I yelled, grabbing Kelly and ushering everyone back towards the safety of my squad car. I'll cover you! shouted another officer as he unloaded several rounds at the creature. Upon reaching Kelly's police cruiser, I carefully placed her in the passenger seat while radioing for medical assistance. Ten to thirty-three! Officer down! I desperately reported. Suddenly, I heard another blood-curdling scream just before seeing a second officer sailing through the air and crashing into Kelly's vehicle. As the second officer's body slammed into the vehicle, I knew we had to act quickly. The creature approached, its dark fur covering a thick, muscular frame. It moved with chaotic energy, each step shaking the earth below it. Narrowly avoiding another swipe from one of its large claws, I rushed into the driver's seat and gunned the engine, trying to put as much distance between us and the creature as possible. Other officers joined in our panicked retreat, their police cars hastily evacuating anyone who was left standing. Those who weren't fast enough were met with the sharp end of the creature's jaws or violent lashings from its ever-advancing appendages. During this chaos, I managed to glance at Kelly's mangled arm and quickly realized that professional help was needed as soon as possible. With my heart pounding in my chest and adrenaline clouding my thoughts, common sense finally prevailed. I grabbed the radio once more and called for backup while simultaneously relaying our coordinates to emergency medical services for Kelly. In a mess of heavy breathing and scrambled thoughts, I alerted the dispatcher to these new developments. Desperately trying to relay information about this horrifying creature proved difficult without sounding hysterical. Still, I hoped that my plea would reach those who could help us. The pain-filled groans from Kelly in the passenger seat reminded me that time was running out. As we sped through the woods with the other officers' cars trailing behind us, I glanced in the rearview mirror, grateful to see no sign of the creature pursuing. My heart ached when thinking about those we left behind those who weren't fortunate enough to escape this sudden bloodbath. The fallen officers' names flashed through my mind. Mark Lewis and Sandra Green both renowned for their bravery and dedication to their duties. Their lives snuffed out for reasons unknown by an unfathomable beast. Once we reached a safe distance from the scene, I allowed the other officers to take Kelly to the hospital. Seeking answers from my colleague's gruesome fate, I headed back to the station, where I desperately hoped that experts from various fields were arriving to study and identify this creature. The following day saw countless experts swarming the forest's devastation, each hoping to find some clue as to what occurred. 
biologists, zoologists, and even a prominent primatologist converged on the scene. It was like an X-Files episode come to life everyone had a theory, but no concrete proof. Despite our extensive search and various leads, we came up empty-handed. However, one pensive young biologist offered a terrifying idea that this creature could be an undiscovered predatory species not known to humans. If true, it opened up a new chapter of horrors beyond our understanding but grounded in reality. As days turned into weeks, no trace of the creature was found. Injured officers recovered while mourning the loss of their colleagues. We were left wondering if we would ever figure out what happened or if this brutal attack would remain shrouded in mystery. I wiped the sweat from my brow as I hauled the last piece of firewood into the cozy cabin. My name's Arnold Finkelstein, and after a stressful few weeks at work, I needed a break. The secluded forest in Oregon seemed like the perfect getaway. As I sat down to catch my breath, I couldn't help but chuckle at the irony of calling this place quiet. My wife, Marjorie, always complained about how city life left us disconnected from nature. Maybe this little trip will remind her of our hometown. I mused out loud. That night we enjoyed a modest meal by the warmth of the fireplace. The minutes turned into hours. Unaware of the passing time, we talked and rekindled our fond memories. It was only when distant howling pierced our ears that we turned our attention to the towering trees outside the window. Must be some wolves out there, Marjorie commented. She was no stranger to wildlife. She had grown up in a small rural town. The following day, we decided to explore the surrounding woods. The damp forest floor crunched under our boots as we walked through clusters of majestic trees reaching towards the sky. As we strolled by a creek, Marjorie noticed something odd twisted amid the ferns. Ripped clothing stained red and violently shredded human remains. We stumbled back in shock and disbelief. Wide-eyed yet surprisingly calm, Marjorie spoke first. Arnold, this doesn't seem right. The howling last night doesn't match what we're seeing now. How could wolves do this? Our attempts to rationalize the situation were fruitless. Something just didn't add up. We decided that it was best to return to the cabin and call for help. On our way back, however... All cell reception seemed mysteriously lost. Upon reaching the cabin, I fetched my trusted rifle for an extra sense of security. The strange discoveries in the woods added an unsettling atmosphere to the cabin that wasn't there before. Marjorie's sister, Imelda, had also come along with us on this trip but had gone off for a walk earlier while Marjorie and I were out. She hadn't returned yet. After my fourth failed attempt to dial local authorities, I felt a rising sense of panic. It became perfectly clear that we needed to head back into the town and seek help ourselves. We couldn't wait any longer, especially since Imelda was still missing. We hastily gathered our belongings, locked up the cabin, and began our trek back through the forest. I took the lead, rifle in hand, eyes scanning for any signs of danger. Minutes turned into hours as we steadily trudged through thick brush and brittle twigs. As we pushed forward on our cumbersome journey, an inexplicable feeling of unease consumed me. Each tree trunk seemed to conceal ominous secrets, only it could tell. Suddenly, we stumbled upon a fresh set of alluring footprints leading directly away from town, hidden in a clean patch of damp dirt near the creek where we'd discovered those mangled remains earlier. What were they running from? Marjorie whispered fearfully. That's when it emerged from the shadows, a grotesque abomination with razor-sharp talons clenched into monstrous fists, 
and enormous scaly wings bristling behind its hulking frame. Saliva dripped from its viscous fangs as it let out an ear-piercing scream that shook every tree within a mile radius. My heart thumped uncontrollably as I raised my rifle to meet the gaze of this unimaginable beast. As I aimed the rifle at the creature, I tried to steady my breathing. Marjorie and I exchanged a quick glance, silently agreeing that we needed to flee. However, before either of us could make a move, the creature swung one of its enormous wings, knocking me off balance and sending the rifle flying from my hands. Disarmed and filled with fear for our lives, we turned and bolted in the opposite direction. As we sprinted through the forest, I could hear branches snapping and leaves rustling behind us, a horrifying reminder that the creature was hot on our heels. Despite my instinct to call for help, I knew shouting would only reveal our location to the monster pursuing us. We dashed through the trees, desperate to find shelter or any means of escape. I could feel my legs growing weak and knew Marjorie was experiencing the same fatigue. Just when it seemed like we couldn't go on any longer, we stumbled upon an old abandoned barn. Frantic, and with no other option in sight, we hurriedly ducked inside. We cautiously surveyed our surroundings as we attempted to catch our breath. The barn was crumbling from years of neglect. Holes riddled the walls, providing minimal protection from the creature outside. But it was our best chance at survival until we could figure out what to do. A few tense moments passed before we heard its guttural growl nearby. Our fear rapidly escalating, Marjorie urgently whispered, Get down! Maybe it won't see us. We flattened ourselves against the dirt floor as quietly as possible and listened intently as the creature's growls grew louder and more aggressive. Twigs crunched beneath its lumbering footsteps as it circled around the barn's perimeter. With no way to call for help and my previous attempts thwarted by poor reception in these woods— I knew that this barn couldn't shield us for long once the creature got wise to our location. The situation was beyond desperate. We needed a plan. The creek. I whispered urgently to Marjorie as realization struck. If we make it back to the creek, perhaps we can swim downstream and lose the creature. Her eyes, full of terror and determination, met mine and she slowly nodded her head in agreement. As soon as the creature's growls began to fade into the distance, we decided it was now or never. Our window of opportunity to make a break for the creek was quickly closing. We burst out of the barn with every ounce of strength left in us, sprinting as fast as our exhausted bodies would allow toward the creek that flowed nearby. We could hear the unmistakable sound of the creature roaring behind us and felt a renewed surge of adrenaline. As we reached the water's edge, we dove in without hesitation, fueled by sheer desperation and an instinctual drive for survival. The ice-cold water shocked our senses, but its relentlessness propelled us downstream and away from that nightmarish monster. The further we went, the quieter its enraged roars became until they finally disappeared entirely. We continued swimming downstream until exhaustion finally threatened to consume us entirely. Somehow, miraculously, Marjorie and I managed to find our way back to town. When we emerged from the woods, battered and terrified but alive, it felt like a second chance at life granted by fate or sheer determination. My mind raced with questions about what that horrifying creature was or what its motivations were for stalking Imelda and attacking us. Unfortunately, our lack of knowledge on folklore or anything paranormal only left us with unsettling assumptions about its origins, a trail of speculation leading nowhere concrete. In the days after our harrowing escape, authorities conducted an extensive search for Imelda without success. She was officially declared missing, her fate unknown but shrouded in an air of doom brought on by our horrifying encounter. 
Now, having survived an unimaginable ordeal with only our lives and a harrowing experience as a permanent reminder, Marjorie and I struggle with the horrifying knowledge that somewhere out in those woods, a monstrous creature still lurks, waiting for its next victim. I sighed as I left work, exhausted from another long day at the office. My name is Nathaniel Haggerty, and I'd been working as an accountant for ten long years. To unwind, I sometimes go hiking in the Appalachian Mountains near my town in West Virginia. The trails provide a peaceful escape from life's stressors. As I approach my favorite trail, I notice that some bushes nearby appeared trampled. Curiously, I followed the crushed vegetation and stumbled upon a crude shack. There was a peculiar smell surrounding it, and I hesitated to open the door. As a skeptical person, I doubted that anything too surprising could be inside. Entering cautiously, I saw crimson stains on the floor that resembled blood. My curiosity turned to dread. Suddenly a cop entered behind me, his badge red. Officer Thorne Tompkins. He asked what I was doing there, and I explained my discovery of the shack. We noticed claw marks on the walls and assumed a wild animal had attacked someone inside. Our conversation was cut short as we heard distant screams. We rushed towards the sound and found an injured hiker named Elspeth Goldenberg. A deep gash stretched across her leg and she described her attacker as a reptilian creature with sharp claws and massive fangs nothing like she'd ever seen before. Thorne called for backup while we did our best to assist Elspeth with her wound. Two other officers arrived, Regina Ormsby and Bartholomew Trillingsworth, both bewildered by Elspeth's story. Searching for clues, we followed a trail of destruction that led us into the thick woods where Elspeth had encountered the creature. The sun began to set as we pushed deeper into the forest, armed with firearms for protection from this unknown foe. The scenic Appalachian landscape around us now seemed eerie under dimming light of dusk. As we continued deeper into the woods, we found further evidence of the creature's presence. Hikers' belongings were scattered and ripped apart, a chilling reminder of the danger nearby. Regina reassured us that help was on its way, and we pressed on. Sporadically, we'd catch a glimpse of the creature's scaly silhouette in the distance, as if it were toying with us. I fought my concerns internally as I began to feel like prey stalked by an otherworldly predator. The sun disappeared below the horizon, leaving us with only flashlights to guide our path. Unexpectedly, Bartholomew cried out, his flashlight revealed a grotesque pile of human remains in various stages of being devoured. The stench was suffocating, and we all struggled not to vomit, our pale faces reflecting overwhelming disgust and terror. As the group composed themselves, we resolved to continue our pursuit knowing now that more lives were at stake. Suddenly, the cracking of branches alerted us that this primeval adversary was nearby. We readied our weapons and formed a circle, our heartbeats quickening in anticipation. A growl echoed through the inky forest, silencing us as we felt a foreboding presence encircle us like a vice tightening around our souls. We could no longer ignore our inner fears and doubts while staring into those reptilian eyes that oozed malice and hunger. With its thick tail swishing like a deadly whip through the darkness, its near invisibility seemed almost supernatural. Before we could react, it lunged at Bartholomew with lightning speed claws bared and needle-like teeth dripping with saliva. Thorne managed to fire his gun just in time to save Bartholomew from certain death but merely grazed the creature's arm. It yelped in agony but quickly vanished into the shadows again. Knowing that it would return with even more fury, we prepared ourselves for a desperate battle against this monstrous predator. 
clenching our teeth, our shaking hands gripped our guns, and we tried to control the fear that threatened to suffocate us all. We were surrounded by darkness, but our senses were sharpened to the point where we could hear each other's breathing. The growls grew closer, and we knew the creature could strike at any moment. We couldn't call for help. The dense woods didn't allow for cell signals, and we were miles away from the nearest town. Bartholomew suggested we scatter in different directions, confusing the creature and increasing our chances of survival. Reluctantly, we agreed. It seemed like our only option. We raced through the woods, fear propelling us forward. I stumbled upon Thorn, who was injured from a previous scuffle with the creature. He warned me that it wasn't far behind him. Every sound, every rustle of leaves or snapping twig, sent us into a panic. Our group was picked off one by one. First went Lana. Her screams pierced through the woods until they were suddenly silenced. Then Marcus. He had tried to shoot it but missed, sealing his fate in an instant. Thorn and I knew we were running out of time. We had to come up with a plan to escape this nightmare or suffer the same fate as our friends. Stumbling upon a natural cavern in the hillside, we decided to hide inside. The small opening offered little room to maneuver, but its restricted access might limit the creature's ability to launch an attack on both of us simultaneously. As we prepared for its arrival, weapons aimed at the entrance, we exchanged terrified glances. The time had come, every sound indicated it was swiftly approaching, ready for its final assault on us. Before breaching our sanctuary, it stood at the entrance, a gruesome sight that made my blood run cold. Scales covered its body with sharp barbs protruding from various places. Its eyes were a sickly yellow-green tint with slitted pupils. As it lunged toward Thorn, I summoned all my strength and shot at it, the bullet ripping into its left eye. It reared back with a guttural screech, blood pouring from the wound in a thick stream. We used this opportunity to scramble out of the cave and run as fast as our legs could carry us. In our peripheral vision, we saw the creature still writhing in pain, now significantly slowed by its injury. Four hours we ran, the adrenaline making us oblivious to the aches and injuries sustained during our ordeal. As we neared the edge of the forest, we finally allowed ourselves to believe we had evaded our monstrous adversary for good. We reached town just before dawn, exhausted, injured but alive. The townsfolk stared at us in shock. As Thorn recounted our harrowing tale, I realized that the creature must be more than just an animal. Perhaps it was some heretofore undiscovered species or even an extraterrestrial being. Regardless of its origins, I felt terrible dread knowing what roamed those woods. In the following days, a search party entered the forest to investigate but found nothing but our fallen friend's mutilated remains, a gruesome reminder of what we had lost. As for me, life would never be the same after encountering such unspeakable evil. The memory of Lana and Marcus haunted me daily. That part of us, the part that once believed in carefree adventures in dark forests, had been forever tainted by that reptilian predator. Still haunted by my experiences, I resolved to leave that place and start anew far away from those cursed woods, the victims' faces forever etched into my mind as a reminder of the price some pay when humanity encounters true horror lurking within nature's shadowy grasp. I'm Tom, a skeptical journalist from a small town called Anson in Maine. Honestly, life is usually pretty dull around here. I suppose the peculiar moose incident last year made things interesting, but apart from that, it's uneventful. One day I accidentally stumbled upon something that grabbed my attention like never before. 
a series of unsolved murders and missing persons cases that span generations were all centered on Anson. There was no decipherable pattern to the killer's actions, except for one curious similarity. Each victim had been brutally mutilated in a unique manner. As I continued exploring this revelation, a gruesome truth emerged when I found old writings describing a mysterious creature with no name, supposedly a wolf-like humanoid that stalked our town, relentlessly hunting its prey. The first time I encountered hints of this creature was in a dark alley behind what used to be the Anson Theater. The smell of iron lingered in the air as I followed traces of blood along the pavement, feeling both curious and disturbed. I turned a corner into the alley, and what I saw next was horrifying. A mutilated body lay on the ground as if posed deliberately, limbs twisted and forced into unnatural positions. The corpse's clothing was torn to shreds, and deep gashes pockmarked the skin. Fresh blood seeped out onto the asphalt below. Summoning what strength I could muster, I quickly snapped photos to document this gruesome scene before stumbling out of there in shock. As nauseating as it was to view such horrific acts inflicted upon another human being, calling for help wasn't an option my phone lacked any reception. Uncertain how deep this rabbit hole went, my desire to capture the truth outweighed any fear for personal safety. Days turned into months as grueling investigative work continued with more shocking revelations along the way. To isolate truths from rumors, I met with Marlo Connolly, a seasoned man in his sixties who had spent most of his life hiking the wilderness surrounding Anson. Marlowe knew every trail like the back of his hand and offered key insight into the strange creature. The wolf you heard about ain't some fantastical beast, Marlowe warned, casting a cautious glance around. It's a humanoid monster, something no one's ever been able to capture or kill. It follows people, sometimes just observing him from afar. The stories Marlowe recounted left me with more questions than answers but it was clear that our town was being terrorized by this evil presence. With no tiresome leads or witnesses offering help, I doggedly persisted in my investigation. Late one evening as I returned to my small apartment after conducting a solo interview in a local bar, I noticed the air was unusually thick with tension. In a deserted alley nearby, I saw a shadowy figure skulking at the edge of my vision. In that instant, there was no doubt in my mind that I had met face to face with the nameless menace haunting Anson. The moonlight briefly illuminated its vicious visage, snarling teeth framed by coarse fur and powerful limbs built for deadly attacks. My heart trembled within my chest as the wayward thought of becoming its next target raced through my mind. Before I could react further, the creature lunged inhumanly across the empty space between us. I dove desperately to one side as its lethal claws narrowly missed me and tore at thin air. Turning on my heel, I sprinted away from danger while vicious growls snapped at my heels. Each pounding footstep carried me further from certain death as homes and streets mingled together in blurry streaks. Death was close its breath hot on my neck inching relentlessly closer. I sprinted around a corner, hoping to put more distance between the creature and myself. As I spotted a public phone booth, a thought crossed my mind. Perhaps I could call for help. Frantically, I dialed the number for the police. My hands shook as I waited anxiously for the operator to pick up. Police, how may I help you? There's, there's some kind of animal attacking people, I stammered. It's not, it's not just an ordinary wolf. It has human-like limbs, and it's huge. It's been stalking our town, and it's after me right now. The operator replied calmly. We'll send a unit to your location immediately. Please remain on the line and stay where you are. I followed their instructions staying on the line as my eyes darted around in panic. 
The snarling sounds and snapping jaws of the creature echoed from afar, but it was approaching closer. Suddenly, two police officers arrived on the scene with weapons drawn. They looked hesitant at first upon seeing no immediate danger, but their demeanor changed when they heard the growls approaching. What is going on here? one officer asked. I don't know what it is, I explained urgently. But there's this massive wolf-like creature chasing me. Before they could respond, a guttural growl erupted from the darkness behind them. The creature lunged into view, its fearsome form illuminated by the moonlight. The officers quickly aimed their guns at the beast and fired multiple rounds. But instead of suffering wounds or falling dead as one would expect, the creature seemed utterly unfazed by their bullets. One officer yelled into his radio for backup as he and his partner reloaded in a state of disbelief. But before they could fire again, the creature turned its attention towards them, pouncing onto one of them with sheer ferocity, tearing through his uniform and flesh with its monstrous claws. Having seen enough, I seized the opportunity to escape this horrific scene. I ran, attempting to follow a path leading towards the outskirts of town, hoping it would be enough to outdistance the creature. As I continued running, I could hear the arrival of backup and more gunshots fading behind me. But the snarling and growls soon dissipated as well. Somehow my effort to leave town appeared successful as the creature seemed occupied with the police. Feeling a small sense of relief, I made my way to the nearby woods and found a cabin where I took shelter. I knew that it would only be a matter of time before that horrifying beast found me once more, but for now, I was alive, alive and desperate for answers. I spent days hidden in the cabin, listening to local radio reports on the aftermath of the incidents. More and more sightings reported, lives lost, and unsuccessful attempts by numerous officers to subdue the creature continued to emerge throughout Anson. My initial speculation turned into a dreadful certainty. Our town was under attack by something we couldn't explain or stop. The nameless menace had brought chaos and death upon us all. One evening as I listened to another grim news update, describing yet another vicious attack that had claimed three more victims, I knew I had no choice but to leave Anson for good. Staying in this cabin was not going to protect me forever. Preparing myself for an arduous journey toward another city where I hoped safety awaited, one final thought echoed through my mind. Was this a werewolf? Could it be possible that such mythological creatures were real? But given what I had witnessed firsthand, it didn't seem too implausible anymore. With a heavy heart, not just leaving behind my friends, family, and all those who succumbed to an unnatural apex predator, but also faced with leaving behind the world of reality I had believed in for so long, I took my first steps towards a new life far away from the horrors of Anson. And although the distance grew between myself and that grisly past, the memories of those who were devoured by that grotesque beast— their desperate screams echoing through the night haunted me for the rest of my life. In my four years as a fire lookout in the Gila National Forest, the solitude never bothered me. I'm not sure if it was a hermetic tendril buried deep within my psyche or just the satisfaction of pure independence, but solitude was never the issue, until that peculiar May evening. Most of my days at the tower were spent observing, scribbling notes, and occasionally radioing to the base station. I'd become familiar with the monotonous lull of wind whispering through pines and the methodical creaking of wood under the weight of time. However, it was during one of these routine observations that I spotted something unsettling. A series of irregular clearings began to appear in patches below, 
precise and clean cuts through the trees as if scooped out by some meticulous machine. I radioed in but received only a static murmur in response. Communication problems weren't unusual, but this silence felt invasive, the click-click-click of failed transmission leaving a void within me. That night I met Red. His post was on the southern ridge. I knew him only by voice over the radio. At around three in the morning, there was a frantic banging on my cabin door. It was red, wide-eyed and drenched in sweat. Between gasps for air, he spoke of an escaped convict rumored to be roaming our woods. A man so unhinged from reality that he'd adapted to live like a beast among trees. As dawn broke, we found ourselves trailing traces of what could only be human activity, remnants of gnawed bone and a shelter clumsily woven from branches. We weren't trackers or hunters. We were watchers accustomed to stillness, not this invasive dance with an unknown interloper. We followed the trail till we stumbled upon a scene both gruesome and perplexing. Animals laid out in patterns across a clearing. Acts not just predatory, but artistic too. No bear or wildcat had a predilection for such morbid displays. Red insisted we head back and wait for backup, but my nerves kept me locked into pursuit. Curiosity sometimes trumps fear even when it shouldn't. The days blurred into a cycle, trace inconspicuous signs of presence during daylight, and huddled together at night discussing what someone capable of such disturbing artistry might do if cornered. Then came our encounter, the climax unstrung from any script nature might write. As we were scouring another grotesque tableau shaded beneath towering ponderosas, a sound unfamiliar yet distinctly human rasped behind us a harsh breathing not quite struggling nor entirely steady. We spun around to find nothing but the oppressive presence of absence, the feeling you get when eyes burrow into your back unseen. Our breaths became ragged echoes of each other as we strained our senses trying to discern any movement through thickets scarred by invisible hands. Our group stood motionless, waiting for a sign of movement in the brush. It was clear none of U.S. would venture to call for help. We had no reception in these woods. We knew the risks before setting out, and it was too late for regrets. Whispers among us grew tense as seconds stretched. Stay close, Red ordered. Those were the only words any of us could manage, our focus fixed on the unseen threat. The underbrush rustled to our left, a slight but deliberate agitation. There it was, an outline in the thicket, large and hunched. As it stepped into a sliver of light, details became apparent. A mass of tangled hair, arms long with matted fur, fingers ending in claws caked with dark remnants. Its eyes stood out most, human yet feral, reflecting a menacing intelligence that saw us as prey or worse. It moved toward Red, who stood nearest. We shouted, though sounds seemed futile against such primordial force. The creature lunged with impossible speed and Red fell amid screams that pierced the stillness of dawn. Blood colored the earth. Red lay motionless while I ran with desperate breath not daring to look back. We reached the town by nightfall, bodies aching with spent adrenaline. We reported what happened, Red's end at the hands of an unknown animal, but skepticism met our tale. Time passed but peace did not return. I often passed by Red's place, reminded that some horrors of nature defy explanation and continue their reign long after victims are mourned and their stories fade into whispers in the woods. I never much cared for waking up early, but as a park ranger stationed at Yosemite National Park, it came with the territory. My name is Arlo Beckett, 
and I've walked these trails long enough to know every whispered secret among the towering sequoias and imposing cliffs that stretch toward the sky. On this particular day, routine bled into the crisp morning air until it didn't. As I patrolled near the fringes of Mariposa Grove, a place steeped in natural beauty, an unusual silence hung heavy. The usually chatty birds were nowhere to be heard, an odd occurrence that had all my senses on alert. Drifting on the breeze was an odor so pungent, it could only spell trouble. Following it, I found a clearing that previously played host to campers' laughter now presided over by stillness and something more sinister, a destroyed campsite with belongings scattered as if a storm had raged through. A gnawing suspicion took hold. Tourists didn't just leave their gear behind. It wasn't until I stumbled upon a camera with its lens cracked and casing covered in an unidentifiable sticky residue that I truly understood something was terribly amiss. I pressed play on the last recorded video and the screen flickered to life, showcasing two hikers, Jonas Mockridge and Lilla Sternin, their faces etched with panic as they spoke of an unseen terror in hushed tones before the footage ended abruptly. Checking radio communications yielded no response. Our remote location often meant unreliable signals. Satellite phones were limited and reserved for emergency evacuations, making connectivity a gamble at best. As sunlight filtered through the towering trees, I journeyed deeper into the woods in search of Jonas and Lilith. Clues were scarce. Drag marks leading off trails suggested an altercation but gave no hint toward predator nor direction of travel. Without evidence of their fate or clear tracks to follow, assistance was futile. Ours became a relentless pursuit with each stride more urgent than the last until something shifted in my periphery. A figure lurched between trees, massive, with matted fur and limbs too long for any bear I'd encountered. Despite my skepticism for legends and tall tales spun by old-timers around campfires, my heart raced at this inexplicable creature nearly obscured by foliage. Specifics were hard to come by without clearly seeing it. Only impressions remained in my mind, power and malice personified in a form that moved with unsettling intelligence. It glanced back once before vanishing from view leaving me grappling with two unshakable truths. This was not normal wilderness behavior, and those hikers were likely its latest victims. For all my calm exterior and instinctual knowledge born from years patrolling these lands, laughter escaped me when imagining trying to explain this back at headquarters. Hardened park rangers don't spook easily. Footsteps echoed in the forest, signaling that I was not alone. Risking a glance over my shoulder confirmed my fear. The creature stalked me with intent. Immediate action was necessary. Evasive maneuvers were my only course. I remembered the compact radio secured in my jacket pocket. I reached for it, thumb pressing down on the distress signal. Nothing but static greeted my ears. The heavy canopy above must be interfering with the connection. Time was against me. My pace quickened, breasts turned to gasps. Safety lay beyond these trees, I thought. If only I could outpace this thing. The terrain grew rockier underfoot, roots and wet leaves threatening to unbalance me with every step I dared steal a glance backward. The creature loomed larger each time I looked back. Its coat was an unkempt mass of dirt and leaves, eyes glinting with a primal understanding that it was the hunter, and I, undoubtedly, the prey. It moved on all fours but could rear on two, displaying an awkward yet terrifying stature. I reached a clearing where sunlight pierced through. There stood a cabin, salvation, maybe temporary refuge. As I neared the door, it became clear why help had not come. Jonas and Lilith lay motionless on the threshold. Their ends were brutal. Markings on their bodies spelled a violent struggle against an overwhelming force. 
I barreled inside and bolted the door. My hands scrambled for anything of use. A flare gun resting atop the mantel caught my attention. Knowing full well it was no match for whatever resided outside these walls, it provided a semblance of hope. Minutes turned to hours as light outside diminished into dusk. The thing did not relent. Claw marks adorned wood as if carving through butter. Finally, the thudding of a helicopter broke through the silence of dread awaiting outside. Rescue had spotted my signal flare sent out hours prior before retreating into this holdout. Wearing blades brought reinforcement. Park rangers armed more adequately to handle what lay beyond comprehension. A plan unfolded quickly. Lure the creature away from me using flares then tranquilize if possible or use lethal measures as last resort. They set out at dusk when visibility dimmed enough to obscure presence but still allowed for tracking by torchlight. The plan went awry rapidly. Trails led teams deeper into uncharted territories where terrain became foe. Only silence returned after flashes of gunfire and primitive roars died down in distance. The creature remained unsighted. Casualties were inevitable amongst those brave enough to confront it. In end briefings detailed size closely matching mythic creatures thought extinct. Perhaps this was what old-timers alluded to around crackling fires without ever realizing truth behind words spoken in jest. Evacuation followed for personnel remaining. No further loss tolerated given circumstances that unfolded earlier in week following unfortunate discovery made at that cabin threshold where Jonas and Lilith met fate too gruesome to detail publicly without causing unrest amongst closest kin or community seeking answers best not found lest they risk same demise. Closure eluded us as rangers left behind forests that had been theirs to protect but now harbored assailant whose kind they could only theorize upon. Proto-historic survival or mutation brought by factors unknown and just as well left undisturbed. We flew away with heavy void where assurance once lived, earth still held secrets defying modern understanding hidden within realms where civilizations reach waned under towering canopies whispering horrors better left untouched by man's curious hand lest we unearth nightmares poised on edge of reality ready to reclaim lands we encroached upon long before our time began or will end. I remember the sun setting over the long stretch of I-90 as I veered my truck onto a less-traveled road towards Ely, Nevada, hauling a cargo I knew nothing about. That was the rule, no questions asked. The dispatcher's name, Zara Maynard, echoed in my mind. She'd been clear. Deliver it by morning. My name is Colt Tanner, a guy who knows the value of silence and the open road. Silence can't betray you. Roads always lead somewhere. Passing the town's welcome sign, a hitchhiker caught my attention. An older gent with steel-gray hair and broad shoulders hidden underneath an oversized coat. The road seldom feels sympathy, but tonight was cool and indifferent to human plight. I chose to stop. We exchanged nods. He introduced himself as Blaze Heron and climbed aboard. The conversation was sparse, revolving around weather patterns and radio static before silence reclaimed its territory. As hours melded into each other under the cloak of darkness, the truck's radio spluttered to life with an announcement crisp enough to draw a thin line of focus in my weary mind. Residents advised to stay indoors. Two missing persons reported. The atmosphere within the cabin grew heavier. As we approached a dilapidated gas station for a much-needed refuel, something felt wrong. The lights flickered like dying stars as we pulled up. Exiting the truck on unsteady legs, I heard a sound that chilled me despite my skepticism, a cry for help emanating from behind the building slapped against my resolve. 
Blaze turned his gaze towards me with an unreadable expression. In that moment of decision, duty confliced with humanity's cry. I couldn't ignore it. Behind the gas station laid grim evidence. Belongings scattered, ground torn up as if by some frenzied struggle that left only silence in its wake. Blaze stood by silently as I dialed 911 with strained urgency in my voice. No answer but endless ringing, we were on our own. Returning to the truck, headlights illuminated our path forward getting back onto our route. Every shadow seemed sinister yet these were just shapes born from light and object. Ordinary. Blaze spoke then, recounting his time in service, deserts and conflict, but skipped over details that didn't fit in a trucker's cab or under starlit skies. The road whispered secrets as we drove on. Strange imprints by the roadside near ragged bushes looked abnormally large for any native wildlife hereabouts. A source of curiosity rather than concern until we reached an abrupt barricade blocking our way forward. Exit cut off, realigning our course meant turning back. The missing report now palpable, a dread creeping into our resolve. Yet time pressed us onward making alternative routes imperative. Satellite navigation found us remote trails previously unknown to me though seemingly familiar to Blaze. As we delved deeper into desolation away from Ely, the name itself seemed an ill-fitted memory. The truck strained against terrain rough and undulating beneath wheels clad in durable rubber yet faltering beneath such unfamiliar trial. Then there they were, in plain sight, figures standing just outside the high beam reach who fled at our approach leaving signs distinctly human and worryingly disjointed smears across rock formations brittle. We exchanged looks, words silent yet echoing within, deciding without speaking to investigate despite instinct suggesting otherwise. Trucking through this stray path between rocks sculpted by time's unyielding hand brought us unceremoniously face to face with one undeniable fate, a body bloodless upon barren earth while another figure watched aloof not thirty paces distanced. Blaze grabbed a tire iron tucked aside for safekeeping, though what safety meant now seemed bleak at best, and stepped towards what appeared man-shaped but carried disquietude older than both witness and victim together bound by shared soil. All else fell away save for need to confront this harbinger of nightmares rooted in reality. Blaze moved with purpose toward the figure, tire iron firm in his grip. I followed close my heart pounding not from courage but sheer dread. We didn't know what awaited us only that a fellow human lay lifeless on cold ground, and justice, or perhaps sheer survival instinct, urged us forward. The figure kept its distance as we approached, its features slowly becoming clear under the ghostly moonlight. It was a man, tall and gaunt with eyes that seemed too familiar with this kind of night. He wore a torn shirt and jeans stained more by time than care. Skin stretched over his bones as if it were reluctant to stay attached. His hands hung loose by his sides, fingers twitching as though they were independent of his will. That's when I noticed the phone signal had vanished we were on our own here in the wilderness. No calls for help could breach these secluded hills. Blaze called out, Stay back! His voice was steel wrapped in velvet, commanding yet measured. But the man came at us. Quick. Silent except for the crunch of earth underfoot. Too late did we realize he did not come empty-handed. In his grasp was a jagged rock, edges capable of rending flesh from bone. We retreated. But the truck was a maze of shadow and metal we had abandoned yards back. Blaze swung the tire iron wide as if to ward off this ghostly assailant. The figure deflected the strike with ease born of madness or perhaps desperation. In one fluid movement too quick for foresight, the man lunged at Blaze who stumbled backward onto unforgiving earth. The rock found its mark across Blaze's arm, 
a gruesome signature written in bloodied lines. I yelled, a primal sound that carried no words but rang with terror our human cry against the dark. Run! I screamed at Blaze who was clambering to his feet despite wounds that would make weaker men weep. We ran, not as heroes in stories do towards danger, but as prey flees predator, through tight spaces between stone guardians risen from Earth's core. We heard footsteps give chase, relentless and rhythmic against the quiet chaos that enveloped us. Once we reached the truck, engines roared to life at urgent command of keys turned hasty in ignition. Wheels spun sending gravel dancing into night as metal heaved forward on refuge's path. Glancing back through rearview mirror provided no comfort nor closure. The figure melded into darkness left behind or perhaps it was never there, an unsettling thought to carry. Miles turned into silence except for breaths fought hard for in one. Blaze beside me nursing wounds that spoke volumes in stark crimson trues against pale skin. Dawn broke over Ely's outskirts like salvation cloaked in orange hues a contrast stark against our night-lived terror that clung like shadows cast by sun's first light. A hospital emerged slow from morning mist, our refuge at last. I maneuvered truck past threshold where help called loud and clear without need for lost signals to transmit our distress. I stayed beside Blaze while white-clad figures made him whole again, or as whole as one can be after night like ours and pondered upon man we had fled from. Could be he went by Elias. The notion came unbidden and yet flitted through my thoughts unchallenged. For he who easily left, or perhaps simply because it sounded right with melancholy that accompanied its contemplation. I left hospital with stitches where skin had once been whole and mind troubled more than body well could claim. Memories etched deep within shades of dark encountered far from Ely's familiar embrace, but closer still to heart's new scarred understanding of world's hidden facets never wished discovered. And so tale ended not with answers sought, but questions left hovering like specters over paths best left untraveled, reminders frail of mortality met under circumstances best forgotten yet eternally etched within those who continue despite terror faced under cover of desolations in different gaze. It always starts the same way, a long haul across the more desolate stretches of Arizona driving my eighteen-wheeler packed with goods that need to get to the other side of the country. My name's Clayton Hodges, and folks who know me well would say I'm married to the road. See, my life's backstory isn't something out of an adventure novel. It's been truck stops, greasy food, and long hours behind the wheel since I dropped out of college. But this trip, it turned out to be different. Driving through the scarred landscape of Navajo County, which unfurled around me like a dusty tapestry, I felt an oddly palpable tension in my chest, a pressure where there was no cause for one. R.J. Saunders was my only company on these trips, one of those guys who's so good with engines you'd think he could charm them into running with just a wink and a nod. This time he was sitting out back with those newfangled motion detectors he liked collecting. As afternoon baked into evening, we decided it was time for a stop near Holbrook to stretch our legs and check the cargo's security. Out here, the land is wide open. You can see for miles in any direction without spying another soul. I was chatting over the radio with R.J., making some crack about his never-ending obsession with expensive gear when suddenly Static cut him off mid-reply. I thought nothing much of it. Dead zones weren't uncommon, until I heard him shouting outside over the roar of idling diesel engines. The back door to my trailer was mangled open as if by brute strength or some industrial tool I couldn't place. Inside, some of the boxes were torn apart, Merchandise scattered like thrown dice. Clay, look at this. 
R.J. hollered from near the gap in our trailer door, eyes wide as dinner plates. He pointed to irregular footprints in the dirt that circled our vehicle and disappeared off towards a cluster of scrub and Joshua trees. We agreed silently that despite our pressing schedule, following those prints might lead us to a thief, or at least an answer to what had disturbed our hall. We made quick work through loose soil and sharp brush only to discover a grisly scene, a field scattered with remnants too disturbing to detail. Items carried personal marks, small toys and worn clothing, the kind you might see packed by someone fleeing home in haste. Amidst this lay Tomas Jankowicz from Dispatch who had rolled out last week with Consumer Electronics. He'd been reported missing three days back. Or what was left of him anyway. His cadaver offered more questions than solace. The damage done was an unspeakable horror a disfigurement beyond violence or accident. Our initial shock gave way quickly to survival instinct. We were clearly dealing with intentional malice towards truck drivers this particular stretch of land had claimed as victims. RJ's motion detectors suddenly sprang to life then, a series of beeps increasing in urgency, and all eyes darted towards their wailing red lights. There he stood, our silent sentinel, a man on the ridge barely silhouetted against twilight's last offering. His stature was tall and lean but unnaturally so, as if stretched by force or choice, long limbs swaying slightly in non-existent wind. R.J., ever prepared, swung up a rifle but froze under that distant figure's unnerving stillness. The man began descending toward us in an unhurried lope. His movements held an otherworldly grace which felt both predatory and precise, as if we were prey ensnared by inevitability rather than chance encounter. In the tense silence, I reached for the radio. With shaking fingers, I aimed to contact dispatch, but static filled the airwaves. The signal was dead. We were cut off. My gaze returned to the man nearing our position. As he came closer, the details of his form became frighteningly clear. His face looked weathered, skin stretched over high cheekbones with a sharpness that seemed almost surgical. R.J. whispered to us without averting his eyes from the scope. Stay back and lock yourselves in. We obeyed without question, retreating into our trucks as R.J. maintained his aim. The figure continued to approach until finally stopping a short distance away. I couldn't make sense of his attire, part road-ragged vagabond, part meticulous collector of artifacts from past victims, necklaces made of what seemed like bone and decaying sinew. His gaze held mine through my windshield with a predatory calculation that suggested he had done this before. There was a knife strapped to his thigh and another one visible in his boot. My mind raced for reasonable explanations for this man's presence, his intent, and the fate of Jankowicz. R.J.'s voice crackled over the handheld radio we each kept in our cabins. "'What do you want?' he demanded fiercely, although his rifle never wavered. There was no response from the man. Instead— he moved with sudden violence towards Kelly's truck, the youngest and least experienced among us, as if her naivety was a beacon for his aggression. Screams pierced the night as we heard Kelly pounding on her door from inside her locked cabin, begging for help while fists pummeled her windows, trying to break through. I wished I could phone for any help but understood instinctively that getting out meant certain death or worse. So I stayed put, my only job survival now. Horror unfolded as we watched helplessly through glass barriers. Electric blue arcs from Kelly's taser lit up her cabin as she fought back desperately until the cracking noise silenced abruptly followed by stillness that was more terrifying than her screams. R.J. finally fired a shot. It caught the attacker in the shoulder causing him to spin but not fall. It seemed only to aggravate him as he turned his focus onto R.J., 
a dogged determination in his limp towards new prey. It was hours before dawn when they found us, the rest of our convoy alerted by Miss Chekint's and RJ's call when signals came back. They found Jankowicz's truck first then ours in disarray. Kelly too had been claimed by this stretch of road. Authorities filled the scene, but it didn't take long for them to find that figure collapsed on softened earth not far from where he'd attacked last, breath gone when they reached him. Investigations would later reveal his identity. Stephen Markson, a former driver whose mind broke after a crash years ago where he lost family. He'd survived and roamed these part ever since haunted by guilt and bent on retribution against those who reminded him of himself before tragedy struck. We spoke little of that night afterward. Communication exchanged through glances heavy with understanding about lives lived on long roads and silent recognition of those who weren't as lucky as we've been. To survive Stephen Markson's broken world on this unforgiving strip of asphalt where people like Tomas Jankowicz were remembered but not revisited in speak, a dispatch call forever missing its confirmation click, and their emptiness filled by shared survival instead. A few short years ago, I spent some time down in the Everglades. Looking back, I wish I'd stayed home. It wasn't a total bust, mind you. I liked the outdoors, and the swamp had a certain raw beauty that appealed to me. If I hadn't run into, well, whatever it was, I might even call it a vacation. My plan was simple, just me and nature. A one-man kayak a stretch of open water, and a few days of peaceful paddling and maybe some fishing. Nothing extravagant. My old man taught me to fish when I was small, and it was something I always picked up again when I needed to unwind. Plus, the Everglades are full of wildlife. I'd always wanted to see a gator in person. I rented a sturdy kayak, packed a tent and some essentials, then headed out through Sawgrass Recreation Park to a small put-in spot. The first day went according to plan. Well, mostly. It turns out that while alligators are awesome, it's less awesome having one pop up an inch from your boat. Thing could have swamped me if it wanted to. The next morning's sunrise made the whole trip worthwhile. Reds, oranges, pinks all painted across the sky and reflected on the smooth water. Calm. Not a single ripple. The only sounds were the birds and the gentle swish of my paddles. It was the kind of moment that almost makes you believe in a higher power. That feeling lasted until a few hours later. I'd set up camp for a lunch break on a small, tree-covered island and was walking near the water when I saw it. Not the whole thing, just a piece, a leg maybe, or an arm. It stuck out of the swampy water, pale and bloated. I figured it was some poor gator or snake, probably washed up on the island. I felt bad for it, but I wasn't about to go digging around in the muck looking for the rest of it. Bad for the nose, that kind of thing. Wrong, I was wrong. Not an animal. When I got a little closer, I saw a hand. Small. A woman's hand. Then I saw the tattered remains of her shirt tangled in the roots of a mangrove tree. Vomit hit me hard, and I stumbled back, retching into the brush. Who leaves someone like that? Who could let that happen? I'd seen a lot of messed up stuff in the city. But this, this was different. Primal. There was no reason for it, no possible explanation. Except maybe there was. There are some real sickos out there, the worst kind. Maybe this was their work. The rational part of me knew I needed to call this in. There was no cell signal, but I knew I'd come across some park ranger sooner or later. I forced myself to walk a circle around the island. Nothing else out of the ordinary, 
Just dense vegetation and swamp stink. I even checked the waterline for signs of a struggle, but the place looked undisturbed. It was almost like she had risen from the muck itself. I don't know how long I sat by my kayak, staring into space. My little wilderness escape was ruined. And worse, somewhere out there, a family would never know what had happened to their girl. I finally pushed off, paddling like a madman to put that terrible island behind me. It was stupid, reckless even. Adrenaline is a hell of a thing, makes you do idiotic stuff. By the time the panic wore off, the sun was dipping below the horizon. The Everglades get dark fast, and without a flashlight or headlamp, it was impossible to navigate the narrow waterways. I blundered around blindly for a while, smashing my kayak into tree trunks and unseen obstacles. Eventually, I beached the boat on a muddy bank and hunkered down to wait for sunrise. The mosquitoes feasted on me that night. Morning came eventually, though I'm not sure I was glad to see it. I hauled the kayak back into the water and started paddling. My goal, find people, any people. The sooner I was off this swamp, the better. After what felt like hours, I heard the faint thrum of an engine. Salvation. It was an airboat, the kind tourists take to see gators. I frantically signaled the old guy driving it, and he swung his craft over to me. When I explained my situation, about finding the body, he went as white as a sheet. Then he got on the radio, and before I knew it, there was a whole search party mobilized. Park rangers, sheriff's deputies, the works. I led them back to the island. I expected a swarm of activity, crime scene text cameras. But when we got there, the body was gone. No sign of it not even a disturbance in the water. The rangers looked at me like I'd kicked their dog. The sheriff straight up called me a liar, like I made it all up just to get a ride out of there. I wanted to punch him. Who does that? Who drags a body into the swamp and then pulls it out again just to mess with me? It didn't make any damn sense. I didn't sleep well that night, or for several nights after. I knew what I saw. They had to believe me, right? The trip turned into a search and recovery operation. We scoured those swamps for days. Not a trace of her. I stuck around to help. Part guilt, part morbid curiosity. The sheriff started keeping his distance from me, giving me the hairy eyeball. Like I was a suspect. Me, just some guy who wanted to go fishing, for Christ's sake. On the third day, they found something else. A bloated, mangled body caught in the roots of the same mangrove tree. This time, it was a man, big dude with a beard, wearing dirty jeans and boots. Looked like he had been torn apart. I couldn't eat for a whole day afterward. I caught a ride home the following morning and burned those swamp clothes. Later, I read in the news they couldn't identify the guy. Nobody reported him missing, no matches in any databases. I also learned there had been other disappearances in the Everglades over the years. Hikers, campers, mostly outdoors the types who got a little too far off the beaten path. Never found. The cops blamed everything on alligators. Or sometimes on snakes. I guess it's easier that way. Explains the convenient lack of evidence. But gators don't drag people down, not fully grown people. And pythons don't leave chunks behind. Whatever did that to the bearded guy, it wasn't any normal predator. After that, I started doing some research. Old legends, regional horror stories. It turns out there are tales in those parts about some creature. A swamp thing. Descriptions vary, but they mostly center on a towering, humanoid figure with inhuman strength. 
They say it can rip a man limb from limb, that it stalks and snatches people who stray too far from civilization. The name the old-timers have for it, that chilled me to the bone, the moss walker. Do I believe in that? Honestly, I don't know. Some days I convince myself that it's all just stories, and that there's some reasonable explanation for everything. But then I remember that woman's hand, the way the sheriff looked at me, and the feeling of being watched in my own apartment. And I'm not so sure anymore. Sometimes, in the quiet of the night, I swear I can hear something moving on my balcony. I always get up the nerve to look, but there's never anything there. Still, I've started double-locking the door and checking the closet before I go to bed. The city isn't exactly safe, you know? Maybe I'm paranoid. Or maybe that sense of being hunted, that feeling that something inhuman is lurking in the shadows, watching, waiting, maybe it's the only sane reaction after all. I never expected that my part-time job as a park ranger would lead me to such a chilling experience, but there I was in the Appalachian wilderness desperately trying to make sense of my reality. My name is Braylon Burroughs, and I consider myself an outdoors enthusiast. I grew up hiking and camping in these woods with my family, always feeling safe and at home in nature until that day. A group of hikers had reported mysterious incidents in the remote area around Saluda Valley. While on my routine patrol, I encountered Sarah Feldman and Ravi Kesha, two fellow rangers who were looking into the peculiar reports. Trackers in nature, they were familiar with tracking elusive animals that lurked in the shadows. We decided to join forces and investigate together. Ensuring our walkie-talkies were charged, we set out to explore the remote area. Though we had radio contact with other rangers and the exact coordinates for a quick rescue, we couldn't shake the ominous aura surrounding us. As anticipated, my fellow rangers were now snapping into action as they spotted unusual broken branches nearby. Further into the thick woodland, we found ourselves at an abandoned logging camp. The eerie remains appeared long forgotten disheveled cabins stood decaying amongst discarded rusted tools. Our surroundings became eerily quiet while examining these forgotten relics. Even the sound of a twig snapping seemed to echo throughout. Suddenly Sarah motioned towards blood-stained claw marks on one of the cabins. Having seen bare claw markings before, these seemed different, larger and more sinister. That was our cue to call for backup over the radio as we couldn't easily dismiss our gnawing apprehension. Emboldened by our collective resolve, we continued investigating with weapons in hand while Ravi told light-hearted jokes attempting to ease our guests' fears about eerie circumstances. Something abruptly caught his eye mid-laughter. A grotesque pile of animal carcasses lay partially devoured nearby. To put it mildly, the gut-wrenching sight couldn't have been a mere result of natural predation. As the sun began to descend into late afternoon, the thick canopy of trees overhead cast an unsettling shadow blanket over our path. It was growing ever colder. We needed extra clothing and supplies to endure through the night. Feeling too on edge to leave each other's side, we contacted camp for support. When Kendrick... The ranger delivering our supplies arrived around dusk. He insisted on staying with us. He was visibly spooked, more so than any of us earlier, and that made me question our decision-making process. However, this only assured me that trust in each other and our ranger training would prevail. Night fell quickly after Kendrick's arrival, and we gathered in one of the cabins for shelter using flashlights to illuminate the space. We could still communicate over radio, but chose not to jeopardize revealing our location considering the vulnerability it may invite. 
Keeping our conversations to a minimum was an unspoken agreement shared among us. As Kendrick shared anecdotes about his family back home in Michigan, a sudden panic scream cut through his soft-spoken recollections. The sight of fear in his eyes became a mirror reflecting my own dread as we scrambled outside into the impenetrable darkness to identify its source. Turning towards night vision goggles for a clearer visual amid chaos, I caught my first glimpse of the monstrous antagonist lurking amidst tall trees and thicket. The creature was immense with muscular limbs adorned by dagger-like claws that would have made its predecessors shudder. Its bloodshot glare not only emitted terror but demanded fearful admiration as every move we made betrayed my mind's plea to remain discreet. We had yet to see what this beast was capable of inflicting upon helpless animals, though reconsidering those chilling carcasses gave me a profoundly disturbing clue. Unsure if it could sense our presence, we readied our firearms, praying they'd deter potential aggression. In this moment of heightened anticipation and paralyzing dread, the creature grew silent. We dared not to breathe or move as not to provoke the beast or telegraph our location. The gradual increase in tempo stirred the unspoken anxiety between us. Our radio remained ominously silent. As the unbearable silence continued to stretch on, I realized that we needed to act fast. Our group huddled together, discussing our options. Calling for help seemed like the most rational course of action, but we feared that drawing more people into this nightmarish situation would only end in more tragedy. Our only choice was to find a way to escape without alerting the creature of our intent. We split up into two groups, each armed with nothing but our wits and sheer determination. As we moved stealthily through the forest, I prayed the beast wouldn't find us. The agonizing tension continued to build within me. Every snap twig or rustling leaf hammered like a nail into my already frayed nerves. In response to these sounds, my reflexes tightened my grip on my weapon while my mind raced through potential strategies for survival in case of a sudden attack. Without warning, the creature pounced on one of our own, Sarah. The gruesome scene unfolded before us as it sank its dagger-like claws into her flesh and tore her apart with an almost unnatural strength we never witnessed before. Her screams echoed through the dark, casting a painful symphony in our ears. Shock coursed through me in waves, contorting my face into a twisted mask as I desperately fought back tears. Sarah's horrible fate kept replaying in my mind like an anguished melody stuck on loop. With renewed determination and guilt haunting our every step, we continued our journey through the darkness, minds set on revenge and escape. Eventually, we reached what appeared to be an abandoned cabin providing temporary respite from the hellish pursuit. Inside the cabin, we scoured for anything of use, a weapon or clue to help us understand this horrific creature hunting us down. Hidden behind dust-covered shelves, I discovered a book filled with familiar images embellished under layers of grime, drawings that mirrored the grotesque visage of the monster haunting our lives. Upon closer inspection, the book seemed to be an old, handwritten compilation of local folklore. Flipping to a specific page with a detailed illustration of a beast not unlike the one tracking us, I discovered its species, a niker. According to the book, these vile creatures were menacing shapeshifters emerging from the shadows of forgotten legends and myths. Noticing that these malevolent entities thrived in dark environments, an idea took root. If we could gather enough light to overwhelm it, perhaps the creature would weaken or flee. The remaining group members scrounged for anything capable of producing brightness, fire, lanterns, and our flashlights. Standing at the entrance of the cabin with our makeshift armaments in hand, we heard the creature's distinct growl approaching an almost deafening affirmation that our time was running out. Heaving a collective breath, 
we braced ourselves for the confrontation ahead. As soon as it appeared within range, we unleashed an inferno of fire and light upon the monstrous figure. It recoiled from the onslaught, emitting guttural screeches and snarls. We pressed together as an impenetrable wall of illumination, forcing it further back into the darkness where it belonged. Cursing through clenched teeth and seemingly weakened by our combined efforts, the creature finally retreated into obscurity, vanishing like a nightmare dissipating upon waking. Exhausted from our ordeal but invigorated by victory, we embraced and offered tearful eulogies for Sarah's valiant spirit. In a single unexpected incident, we had faced a preternatural terror from beyond the realm of comprehension, and won. Yet Sarah's tragic loss served as a grim reminder that survival carried burdens and consequences. Emerging from that night's gruesome battle for survival, a testament to human resilience and courage, we vowed never to forget her sacrifice or those chilling days spent hunted by an ancient horror. Realizing the strength that united us, and the fact that we faced our deepest fears, our ragtag group left the nightmare behind and returned to the world of the mundane with a newfound appreciation for life's light amongst its darkest shadows. I was setting up camp after a long day of hiking when I happened to glance up and catch the sunset over the dense pine forest in Minnesota. My name is Luke Carrington, and I've always been drawn to nature, ever since my father took me fishing when I was just a kid. As a freelancer, with no wife or children, I took any chance I could to explore the great outdoors. As the sun dipped below the horizon and an eerie silence settled over the woods, a guttural growl pierced the air. Suddenly alert, I grabbed my flashlight and scanned my surroundings. Little did I know how my life would change from that moment onward. I met Rachel Watts and her brother Daniel at a nearby campsite that night. They were sitting by their fire, drinking beers and laughing at each other's jokes. Feeling uneasy from the strange growl earlier, I invited myself over to their fire for safety in numbers. While making introductions around the crackling fireplace and listening to Rachel's hilarious stories of her clumsiness, we heard rustling in the foliage nearby. Startled, we all turned towards the sound, straining our eyes to make out any shapes behind the branches. The beams from our flashlights caught something moving swiftly in the darkness, something large and muscular. The creature let out another fierce growl before vanishing deeper into the woods. We exchanged fearful glances. None of us had ever encountered anything like this before. It's probably just a bear, said Daniel hesitantly. No way, responded Rachel nervously. There's no bear with that kind of speed, unless it was starved. Whatever it was, we agreed that hunkering down together for the night would be our best option for safety. Despite this decision, sleep remained elusive for all three of us. The next morning, while gathering our gear to leave as quickly as possible, we found evidence of the creature's grisly deeds nearby. Torn shreds of clothing and twisted bones were all that remained of some unfortunate hiker or camper. The gory sight only heightened our sense of urgency, driving us to move away from this nightmarish hellscape. As we made our way through the wilderness, trying to find civilization during daylight hours, we couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. At various points, Rachel would insist she had glimpsed the creature— its eyes shiny like glass, stalking us silently from a distance. This revelation left us even more shaken and desperate to find help. With no reception on our cell phones due to the remote location, we decided to split up. Luke and Daniel would search for someone who could offer assistance, while Rachel stayed behind to guard their makeshift camp. The brothers crept cautiously through the endless trees, 
their senses on high alert and muscles tense with adrenaline. Suddenly, a blood-curdling scream echoed through the forest. Rachel was in danger. Ignore it, advised Daniel calmly. It could be that creature mimicking her voice to lure us into a trap. Damn it, exclaimed Luke quickly thinking on his feet. All right, I'll go back for her anyway. It's too risky leaving her alone. He ran back to camp with fear coursing through his veins. As I sprinted back toward the camp, images of Rachel's terrified face flashed through my mind. Every broken twig and crunch of leaves beneath my feet only heightened the sense of danger enveloping us all. Upon reaching the camp, I found Rachel sitting on the ground, her limbs shaking uncontrollably. Blood soaked the foliage nearby, evidence of a struggle mere moments prior. Keeping a wary eye out for any movement, I called out to her, trying to get her to gather herself. Rachel, we need to move now. My voice was firm but quiet, unwilling to alert whatever lurked just beyond the shadows. She nodded systematically and rose to her feet, leaving behind the gruesome sight. We continued together back through the forest, always looking over our shoulders in paranoia. Until we knew for certain what hunted us, calling for help might invite even more danger. As we met with Daniel several miles away from the original campsite, he offered a shocking revelation. I think I know what's after us, Daniel whispered as we caught our breath. I found some old markings on a carved tree trunk. It looks like it's been here for centuries. He pulled out his phone to show us a picture, and then continued. I tried searching online for anything similar and stumbled upon a detailed folktale about a creature known as Glastig. Glastig? I questioned him skeptically. Yet nothing could prepare me for what would come next. According to Daniel's research, this creature was once human but had since become something far more dangerous, twisted and consumed by darkness. As it took on animal-like behavior and viciously hunted anyone who entered its territory, its physical characteristics mutated further into an inhuman visage. Twisted bones framed its emaciated body as if it were rotting alive. The Glastig had haunted local folklore for centuries, driving fear into countless hearts. Now it seemed to be stalking us as well and, with no way of knowing how to confront or escape it, our situation seemed hopeless. Even so, we refused to give up, desperate to find some semblance of safety or means of communication. We quickly developed a plan. Daniel and Rachel would watch our backs while I went ahead and scouted for any signs of a road or a nearby town. It was risky but necessary. We all agreed that there was no other choice if we hoped to survive this waking nightmare. As I searched through the dense forest, strange noises echoed around me leaves rustling, distant animal calls, and the faint sound of water dripping from the treetops. It felt like my reality had melted away, replaced by a monstrous landscape straight out of the stories my grandmother used to tell me as a child. Finally, I stumbled upon a dirt road this had to lead somewhere. Just as I whipped around to signal my companions that I had found something, Rachel's gasps of horror rang out in the distance. I raced back toward them only to find Daniel clutching his leg, blood streaming down his torn clothing. Glastig had attacked. Rachel managed to drag him away from the creature before it could do more damage, but now he was gravely injured and needed help quickly. Gritting my teeth in determination, I shared the news about the road with them we would follow it and hope for salvation. It took us hours to make our way along the dirt path with Daniel limping terribly due to his injury. Yet just as dawn broke through the tree's canopy above us, we found ourselves on the outskirts of a small town. Buildings loomed ahead like beacons amidst this sea of darkness. We tended to Daniel's wounds as best we could in a small town clinic which thankfully wasn't deserted after all. 
As we sat silently in the waiting room, drained from the horrors we had experienced during the last harrowing days, I vowed never to forget our fallen companions or the terror that lurked within the shadows. Our ordeal was over, but our hearts would forever bear the scars of this impossible encounter with the sinister Glastig. Let it be known that even in a world devoid of mysticism and ancient beliefs, there are still horrors hidden among us, lurking just beneath the surface of what we think is reality. The battle might be behind us, but a newfound awareness of darker forces would forever accompany us on whatever paths lay ahead in life. I never thought I'd find myself in a place like Helena, Montana. What started as a routine business trip had turned into the worst ordeal of my life. The town seemed so quiet and peaceful during the day. People were friendly. Everything appeared so normal. Little did I know that underneath that mundane exterior, something sinister lurked. My name is Oriental Landry and I work for a small software company based out of Colorado. My job often involves traveling to remote locations to install and troubleshoot our products for clients. This time, I was sent to upgrade a local police department's outdated systems. On my first night in Helena, as I walked back to my hotel after dinner at the local diner, I decided to pass through a nearby park. Suddenly, Without any warning, I heard a chilling scream piercing the cold air. Turning toward the sound, I saw a figure running away from me. It didn't take long for me to notice that this person was limping and covered in blood. The primal fear in my gut convinced me to call the police immediately before pursuing the injured individual myself. To my mounting dread, I realized there was no reception in that area of the park. I tried several times without success. Hoping that whoever was responsible for the person's injuries wasn't lurking nearby, I cautiously approached them and introduced myself. The frightened young woman desperately clutching her leg with her drenched hands identified herself as Maribel Boone. As a single father raising two kids on my own after parting ways with their mother a few years ago, my current challenge was strikingly different from managing grocery lists or helping with math homework. I quickly removed one half of my shirt and wrapped it around Mary Bell's leg to stem her bleeding. While dressing her wound, she divulged how she had been taking an evening stroll when a horrific creature suddenly materialized behind her. She detailed its reptilian features, a long, sinewy body covered in dark, rough scales, long, claw-like fingers capable of ripping into flesh, several rows of razor-sharp teeth which used a disgusting black liquid a terrifying portrait of a living nightmare. After carrying Maribel to a nearby bench and laying her on it, I decided to venture deeper into the park, compelled to find the source of this chaos. Slowly, and with great caution, I advanced and followed scattered pools of blood along the path. My breath caught in my throat as I stumbled upon what had once been an ordinary jogger. Their life ripped away from them by something so inhuman that my rational mind struggled to comprehend it. The mangled body was unrecognizable, torn to shreds in a gruesome display of savagery. At that moment, something rustled nearby. My heart rate escalated as adrenaline surged through me. Grinding my teeth while clenching my fists tightly, I edged closer to the faint noise, straining my eyes in an attempt to discern the source. Suddenly there it was. The abominable creature emerged from the thicket slowly, dragging another lifeless victim behind it. With no sign of police or help arriving soon and caring more about survival than capturing this monstrosity for science or justice, I steadied myself as it locked eyes with me a mere mortal pitted against an alien beast. Summoning every ounce of courage within me, 
I charged at the vile creature and collided with its scaly form which was surprisingly solid, like tangled roots combined with muscle. As we clashed, a guttural growl echoed from deep within its bizarre anatomy as it flung aside its latest prize in favor of a more defiant adversary, me. Engaged in close combat with this horrifying entity amid Helena's eerie darkness each minute feeling like an eternity we grappled ferociously, either of us giving ground. The beast struck out with its claws, gashing my side as I tried to shove it off of me. As screams in the distance joined our cacophony of terror, I felt this nightmare tighten its grip. Despite the searing pain from the claw marks, I knew I needed help or I wouldn't stand a chance against this beast. My phone was in my pocket, but it seemed impossible to reach for it while wrestling with this monster. The creature struck again, this time sinking its teeth into my shoulder. I screamed, feeling blood pour from the wound. But somehow, in that brief moment of distraction, I managed to snatch my phone and dial emergency services. The call connected and before I could utter a word, the operator heard my screams and the commotion from our struggle. What's happening? Are you in danger? The operator asked urgently. Help some things attacking me. Helena! I managed to pant between gasps of panic and pain. Situating nearest unit to your location. Stay on the line. Hanging on through sheer willpower and instinct, I continued clashing with the reptilian abomination. Its multiple rows of serrated teeth missed by a hair as we tussled violently, thrashing at each other as if our lives depended on it. To stay alive, I tried to keep near enough to prevent an agile lunge from catching me off guard while being far enough to avoid its deadly grasp. But amid this chaos came an opening— a split second when its murderous intention was suspended in its beady eyes that locked onto mine. It was then that I shoved it away with all my remaining strength. As it crashed into a nearby tree trunk, momentarily disoriented from the impact, sirens faintly wailed closer with each passing second. Gathering every ounce of strength left in me and ignoring the crippling agony of my inflicted wounds, I stumbled away into the darkness seeking refuge, praying salvation would soon arrive. The sirens grew louder, their flashing lights danced through the tree branches as they approached. At last, help had come. But when first responders found me, their eyes widened in horror and shock. Although they must have experienced gruesome scenes during their years of service, it was evident they weren't prepared for anything like this. What happened to you? One of them asked, trying to hide his terror. I don't know how to explain it. I stammered, pointing towards where the wretched creature and I had just fought. It was huge, reptilian-looking, but that's all I can tell you. Suddenly, a blood-curdling scream from one of the officers cut through the tense silence. We watched in terror as the monster reared its head, eyes ablaze with anger as it sprang and mauled the unfortunate officer. We need backup! Fire at will! cried an officer, while the others aimed their firearms and began shooting at the beast without hesitation. The creature shrieked in pain as bullets tore into its flesh, but it relentlessly advanced. Realizing that further casualties lay in store if we remained there much longer, another officer commanded that we retreat. As we made our escape back to civilization, adrenaline coursed through my veins once more as my mind reckoned with what transpired earlier tonight, nature's most gruesome unknown lurking amidst Helena's dark forests hunting humans unopposed for countless years. Those stories of the bloodshed wouldn't fade soon. What happened to Randy, one of the responding officers who lost his life that night? Lingering questions haunted us all. How had such a creature come into existence? Why hadn't anyone encountered it before tonight? 
Was it just a freak occurrence from nature or some genetically engineered abomination birthed far away that ultimately found its way here? Perhaps we'll never know for certain. It's often said that you don't really know your colleagues until you've worked with them under extreme stress. I never truly understood the weight of this statement until it happened one muggy afternoon deep in the Allegheny National Forest, where our secluded government research facility is cleverly tucked away. I had been working there for a few years, burrowed in secrecy, in collaboration with the U.S. government on erratic genetic experiments that were never meant to reach the ears of the public. My name is Zephyrus Calhoun, and the day that changed my entire perspective of existence started just like any other. The facility was a labyrinth of cold metal and unnerving silence. The soft hum of machinery was our perpetual companion. My colleague, Dr. Vianca Rothwell, was a woman of uncommon intellect, her surname as odd as her habits, and she joined me in our routine data analysis. Zephyr, I swear if these samples don't yield some results soon, I'm going to reprogram the coffee machine to dispense something stronger. She joked with a wry smile. Humor was scarce but appreciated. Our job was primarily monitoring genetic mutations and their volatilities, a dance with nature that teetered on the edge of ethical boundaries. That day we had been testing a series of samples from Fluviorum testudines, river turtles known for their rapid healing abilities. As we peered through our microscopes, a frantic radio call broke through. It was Cecil Merowick from security. Zephyr? Cecil here. His voice crackled over the radio. A rare occurrence unless something had gone awry. We got an issue with the perimeter fence down by Sector 7B. Gonna need your eyes on this. Bianca raised an eyebrow but said nothing as I grabbed my utility belt, where a standard-issue sidearm rested, and I made my way out, leaving her alone with her cells and petri dishes. Trekking through the dense underbrush towards Sector 7B, I couldn't help but think about all those cheesy action movies where someone says, I've got a bad feeling about this. Truth be told, as someone who thought themselves immune to superstitious inklings, even my gut seemed intent on making its unease known. The fence had been torn asunder, not cut or sabotaged, but as if some behemoth had decided to use it as dental floss. Cecil came up beside me, his eyes wide and searching the tree lean constantly. Never seen anything like this before, he muttered. We should call for backup. He moved for his radio before stopping short. No signal. Skeptical but increasingly alarmed that the fence's state twisted and shredded we retreated into the safety of the facility not knowing that safety was now far too relative a term. We locked down every entry point and huddled around security monitors waiting for some sign or creature to emerge from the opalescent mist now settling upon our corner of wilderness. Hours went by, our only visitor being Bianca delivering coffee cup top-ups and exchanging tense small talk that smacked more of distraction than correspondence. No help was coming, all lines outside had curtly died away. Then dusk approached, or what felt like it amid the undisturbed trees, and that's enough time for shadows to play tricks on your eyes. Or so I told myself until one shadow moved contrary to any breeze's whisper. Cecil had seen it too, a fleeting glimpse where outline didn't match known forms, elongated limbs and an unnatural gait like pulled taut over too many joints where Cecil whispered to me about local tales describing stickmen stalking woods luring travelers astray, antagonists handed down in hushed tones never believed until seen firsthand. The reality edged closer crawling through underbrush coming straight towards us, or so it seemed, 
the monitors could only offer fragmented snapshots its form blotting out views when suddenly loomed near one camera posted next to Dr. Rothwell's lab just feet from where she mulled over notes oblivious to encroaching doom. I called to Cecil in a low voice. Camera 4. He turned to the bank of monitors and saw the distorted form hovering near Dr. Rothwell's lab. We stared, hoping for some logical explanation to materialize. None did. We had no weapons, no means of defense, and our phones chirped back only silence. The landlines were dead. We need to move, Cecil said. We left our observation post. The urge to warn Dr. Rothwell fought against our instinct for self-preservation. We reached her lab door and found it ajar, but something was wrong, a thick metallic scent hung in the air. Cecil pushed the door open wider, and we entered. Dr. Rothwell lay slumped over her desk, lifeless, a sight that rejected any semblance of reality we clung to, not by natural causes but by force, with deep lacerations on her back. The window had been smashed from the outside. Our eyes met, where this communication passed between us. The need for help was immediate yet impossibly out of reach. We backed out of the lab, our legs carrying us faster than rational thought could catch up. We sought refuge in an equipment shed nearby. Hours passed as darkness settled around us like a shroud. The creature remained outside our flimsy shelter throughout the night, its unnaturally long silhouette casting shadows under the moonlight, its presence sending ripples through the stillness. As dawn broke, we attempted an escape while it roamed at a distance, its sharp features and disjointed limbs more discernible now in the morning light. We reached town by sheer luck and exhaustion. The aftermath was a haze of police interviews and incredulous looks whenever we tried explaining without sounding insane. They found traces of an unknown DNA on Dr. Rothwell's wounds, something not catalogable as any known animal or human. We stayed at a local inn for days until authorities concluded their investigation, deeming it an animal attack despite the evidence suggesting otherwise. Life slowly returned to its normal pace with one alteration. We avoided the wilderness, sticking to well-lit paths and populated areas. People forgot about Dr. Rothwell in time, but I remembered her every time I caught glimpse of elongated shadows stretching just too far across my path, the assumption of what lurked in those woods lingering at the edge of my thoughts. My name is Blake Palmer, and this happened to me in the spring of 2006. I'm a field operative for a black ops division of the CIA, the kind of guys they disavow if things go south. My job description has never included the words cryptid or undead, but life, apparently, has a twisted sense of humor. I'd been stationed deep undercover in rural Missouri tracking some shady arms deals going down in a backwoods militia group. We're not talking duck hunters and weekend warriors here, but hardened survivalists, the kind who build bunkers and believe the apocalypse is right around the corner. The job itself was routine, nothing more than setting up surveillance, monitoring chatter. Until my third night out, when the routine took a very, very sharp turn down crazy town. I had the night shift, holed up in a cramped deer blind, thermoscope trained on the militia's ramshackle compound. Hours of boredom punctuated by bursts of activity, guys lugging crates, muffled conversations. Then, around 2 a.m., something moved out past the tree line. At first, I figured it was a stray deer. The thermal image was humanoid, but hunched over moving in an odd, jerky way. It got closer, and something about the elongated limbs, the too-big head, sent a shiver down my spine. 
the thing stepped into the faint moonlight, and my muttered curse died in my throat. This wasn't a human, not anymore. I'd seen enough questionable autopsies for a lifetime when I was in medical school. This was a reanimated corpse, skin gray and shriveled, mouth hanging open in a silent snarl, and the eyes, empty pits of darkness. I fumbled for the radio, but the thing lunged, moving with inhuman speed. It slammed into the side of the blind, with splintering as its decayed hands tore at the flimsy structure. I fired a shot, more of a reflexive panic response than anything. The bullet tore through its shoulder, but it didn't even flinch. The blind was coming apart under the assault, and I had nowhere to run. Then, another sound, gunfire, not from my direction. The creature hissed, the sound like a punctured tire, and whirled around. Two figures emerged from the trees, the leader wielding a huge double-barreled shotgun. The stocky guy behind him shouted, over here, you government stooge! Before I could process this turn of events, the shotgun roared. The blast knocked the creature backward, leaving a gaping hole in its chest. Somehow, it was still upright, gurgling and twitching in the dirt. I stumbled out of the collapsed blind, my side throbbing where a splinter of wood had caught me. Name's Jebediah, this is Elias. The man with the shotgun grunted in way of introduction. They looked like stereotypical mountain men, beards down to their chests, but their gear was all top-of-the-line military issue. Didn't think the feds knew about these fellers. Jebediah nodded at the twitching corpse. You hunt these things? I managed to ask. The whole situation was so far beyond my worldview that my brain was scrambling for purchase. Not hunt, son. Protect. Elias spoke for the first time, his voice surprisingly soft. These folks? Used to be neighbors, for the sickness got em. It slowly dawned on me. This wasn't just a crazy militia. They were some kind of self-styled guardians protecting their town from whatever the hell turned folks into these shuffling nightmares. Out here, miles from anything resembling official help, they had to take matters into their own hands. How, how does this happen? My voice was barely a whisper. I'd seen the classified files, dissected the weird and unknown, and none of it prepared me for this. Elias shrugged, a grim set to his jaw. We call it the blight. Don't know how it started, but it's spreading, so like. Jebediah chuckled bitterly. Fed boy here, looking like he might just puke up his guts. He slung his shotgun over his shoulder, motioning for me to follow. We gotta clear up this mess before sunrise. No telling what draws them out, but come daylight they'll find shelter. And that's how I ended up helping two backwoods hunters drag the rotting corpse to a clearing rig with trip wires and what looked suspiciously like C4. They told me not to ask too many questions, something about preserving the delicate balance. I wanted to argue, to yell for backup for scientists to swarm the place, all the usual government protocol. But out here, watching Jebediah's weathered hand hit the detonator, it felt hollow. I spent the next few weeks in an odd limbo filing sanitized reports that didn't mention undead horrors, getting debriefed by men in sterile suits who seemed more disturbed by my mention of backwoods hunters than the reanimated corpses. In between, I was shipped up north to help Jebediah and Elias fortify their perimeter against the growing blight. These fellers getting bolder, Jebediah grumbled as he reloaded his shotgun with a practiced motion. He and Elias had taught me how to handle their rough-and-ready arsenal, how to track the creatures by the sickly sweet scent that hung in the air around them. It was a bizarre reality part special forces training, part gruesome country ghost story. Their little town was a bastion amidst a sea of decay. Barricaded streets, boarded-up windows— 
people whose eyes carried both fear and a stubborn kind of defiance. They'd lost folks to the blight, lost parts of themselves, but their community remained. That alone felt like a small victory amidst the encroaching horror. Then came the night that changed everything. It started with an eerie silence, the kind that presses down on you with an almost physical weight. No sound of crickets, no rustling leaves, just an unnatural stillness hanging over the valley. They're organizing, Elias said, his words coming out tight and low. The firelight in his eyes reflected a fear far deeper than anything I'd seen him display before. We manned our posts atop the makeshift barricade. Hours ticked past with agonizing slowness. Then, a flicker of movement at the tree line. Not the shambling gait of a lone creature, but a coordinated approach. There were dozens of them, converging from all sides. The first wave crashed against the barricades. Elias shotgun boomed, dropping two of the rotting figures before they could reach us. I opened fire, picking out targets in the darkness, the smell of cordite and decay choking the air. But there were too many, their decayed bodies clawing their way over the piles of their own fallen. Fall back! Jebediah yelled. He tossed something that landed near my feet, a flash of light and a deafening roar filling my ears. A flash bang. I'd heard of them, never imagined having to use one in the middle of nowhere against walking corpses. We retreated toward the center of town, covering each other with staggered bursts of gunfire. It was a fighting withdrawal, ugly and desperate. We couldn't hold them. Every flickering shadow looked like a potential attacker. Every muffled moan seemed to be whispering my own doom. I lost sight of Jebediah in the confusion, a knot of terror twisting in my gut. A decaying hand shot out from a darkened doorway, grabbing my ankle, dragging me into the inky blackness. I fired blindly, hearing a wet, gurgling sound as my bullet found its mark. I kicked free, scrambling back into the open. The church! Elias was yelling through the chaos, pointing toward the steeple visible in the distance. It made grim sense, elevated position, solid stone walls. A last stand, perhaps. We sprinted, dodging and weaving as the blighted figures pressed in on us. Reaching the church felt like an impossible feat the heavy wooden door slammed shut behind us, the silence inside a stark contrast to the snarls and moans coming from outside. We barricaded it with anything we could find, pews, a fallen crucifix, our dwindling hope. There was no sound of pursuit, just the chilling silence that stretched on and on. Had we fought them off? Were they waiting, trying to starve us out? My gaze landed on the stained glass windows, picturing those decayed hands breaking through, a grotesque mockery of the images of saints and angels. Suddenly, a thud against the door, followed by another. The flimsy barricade bowed inward. They're strong as damn oxen when they get riled up, Elias muttered, raising his shotgun again. I reached for my own weapon, my movements numb. We both knew there was only one way this ended. Another thud, harder this time. Wood splintered, and I saw a withered arm punch through the widening crack. That's when we heard it. A faint sound at first, growing louder by the second. Not the moans of the undead, but the rhythmic thumping of helicopter blades cutting through the night air. A spotlight swept the ground, illuminating the swarm of creatures surrounding the church and washing over us in a blinding beam. Then, a voice booming through a loudspeaker. This is the United States Army. Stand down and prepare for immediate extraction. Hope surged through me, a feeling almost as terrifying as the despair that had preceded it. It wasn't over. For now, at least. The aftermath was a whirlwind of medical quarantines, 
debriefs lasting longer than I had sleep, and the gnawing sense that the worst was yet to come. Jebediah and Elias vanished, presumably spirited away into some shadowy task force formed to deal with this new, terrible reality. My own superiors looked at me like I was some kind of tainted goods, an unreliable witness to an unbelievable catastrophe. I put in my resignation, refused their offers of desk jobs and heavily monitored psych evals, took a chunk of savings and bought myself a remote cabin nestled deep in the woods, high in the Appalachians. Doomsday preppers had the right idea, it turns out just the wrong enemy in mind. The solitude out here is both my prison and my sanctuary. I stockpiled weapons, supplies, everything learned from my time with Jebediah and Elias. Every night, I sit on my porch, shotgun within reach, listening to the rustle of the wind, straining my eyes toward the darkness at the edge of the clearing. Because you never know what— or who might come walking out of those woods. My name is Elias Kane, and this happened to me on October 23, 2020. I was a fresh-faced rookie CIA analyst back then, not a field agent, mind you. But then again... Who needs muddy boots when trouble can find you in a cubicle? I'd always been the curious sort, had a knack for patterns and the thrill of uncovering something unseen. It probably landed me on that special project's team, the one they joked was the X-Files with less aliens and more bureaucracy. My first big assignment came innocuously disguised as a data leak. It was in the heart of Yellowstone National Park a geothermal sensor offline, wildlife cams malfunctioning, all in a localized area. Routine stuff, until I dug in. The glitch coincided with a rash of peculiar missing persons reports. Hikers, the adventurous kind, disappearing without a trace. No bodies, no gear, no animal attack signs. The Bureau called it cold cases, an unfortunate reality out in the wilds. But those coincidences itched at me like a mosquito bite you just can't ignore. Weeks later, I was bumping along in a park ranger jeep heading to the problem zone. Alongside me was Zara, a senior ranger with more grit than a gravel road and a gaze that missed nothing. We made an odd pair, the analyst and the toughened outdoors woman. Conversation flowed easy, though. Turns out, we both had a bone to pick with the term. Unsolved. She'd lost a brother years back on a solo camping trip in those same woods. Our destination was a deep valley locals called Owl's End. The old caldera rim was a tangle of cliffs and twisted trees, the kind of place that had more shadows than light even at midday. I set up my gear a mix of standard tech and a few unofficial gadgets courtesy of the weird science division of the agency. Zara kept watch, her rifle a comfortingly solid presence against the unsettling silence. It wasn't the silence of nature, though this was a void, an absence of the usual rustlings and birdsong. The first glitch registered at dusk a thermal spike that made no sense. Then, the ground tremor detectors went haywire, readings localized and impossibly strong. Zara swore under her breath, hand tight on her rifle. I knew that look. It said the predators here weren't the four-legged kind. Movement flickered across the screen something big, too fast for cameras to catch cleanly. We shared a look, adrenaline spiking. Whatever was out there... It knew we were watching. The game had changed. Night fell like a shroud. I adjusted the sensitivity on our gear, pushing the limits of what those gadgets were meant to detect. And that's when I saw it. An outline on the thermal camera, warped and shifting against the chilled rock and trees. 
It was immense, nearly nine feet tall, its skeletal limbs impossibly long, camouflaged by patches of earth and foliage clinging to its form. My mind raced, trying to rationalize it, categorize it, and failing spectacularly. Zara must have seen the horror on my face. What is that thing? She breathed voice taut. I don't know. I admitted, the words feeling pathetically inadequate then it charged. Not in the predictable rush of an animal, but in disjointed bursts, moving like a stop-motion animation brought terrifyingly to life. Zara fired, the rifle shots echoing across the valley, but the creature seemed unfazed. It dodged between trees with impossible agility, its elongated limbs snatching at Zara as she scrambled backward. I fumbled for my pack, fishing out a canister with shaking fingers. Flare! I yelled, tossing it at Zara. She dove to the side just as the creature swiped at her, its razor-sharp claws gouging deep furrows into the ground where she'd stood a heartbeat before. She caught the flare, yanked the cap, and struck it against a rock. The magnesium light flared with blinding intensity. The creature reared back, screeching a sound that made my teeth vibrate within my skull. The stench of burning leaves and singed. Something filled the air. Zara scrambled toward me as the creature thrashed in pain, blinded by the sudden light. We ran, stumbling through the trees, guided only by the echoes of our own terror and the enraged screeches behind us. We burst out of the valley and sprinted across a clearing, risking exposure for speed. Suddenly, a tree exploded beside me in a shower of wood and leaves. The creature stood at the edge of the clearing, its silhouette monstrous against the moonlight. But it didn't advance. The flare was already dying, and it seemed unwilling to enter the darkness. Breathing ragged, Zara and I backed away, weapons trained on the motionless figure. Then, just as suddenly as it had appeared, it turned and melted back into the shadows. The adrenaline high crashed hard, replaced by a bone-deep chill. We spent the rest of the night hunkered down in a ranger's hut, taking turns peering out at the darkness that had become infinitely more menacing. I filed an incident report filled with technical jargon designed to both obscure and convey the sheer impossibility of what we'd encountered. Expected it to vanish into the bureaucracy, never to be heard of again. I was wrong. Within a week I was back in D.C., not in my dingy cubicle, but a conference room filled with brass I'd only seen in photos. There was shock on their faces, mirrored in my own. No one laughed at my wild descriptions, my thermal printouts that looked like a child's stick figure drawing come to monstrous life. Instead, I was swept into a world I never knew existed. That task force, the one they joked about? Very real. And they were underfunded, undermanned, and facing the kind of threats that scrambled everything you thought you knew about the natural world. My Yellowstone encounter was just one blip on a terrifyingly vast radar. I learned quickly. They taught me, out of necessity. There wasn't time for textbooks and theories. I was thrust into the field, armed with upgraded tech, knowledge I hadn't earned, and an unshakable terror that lurked beneath the surface composure they demanded. Zara joined the team, too her field experience invaluable, her eyes holding a haunted understanding that bonded us beyond words. We became hunters of shadows. The creature in Yellowstone, they assigned it a designation, Wraithwood, based on its mimicry and elusive nature. There were others, given equally chilling names. Each file was a nightmare, each mission a step into unknown territory. It wasn't just about capturing these things. Containment was an impossible dream. We tracked patterns, disrupted hunts, and sometimes, just sometimes, bought a victim precious time to escape. The victories were small, 
the cost high. For every missing hiker we managed to pull back from the brink, there were those we failed. We found bodies, or only fragments, the aftermath of confrontations we were too late to stop. The creature in Yellowstone eluded us, but reports of disappearances kept trickling in. It was learning, adapting, becoming a deadlier predator with each passing season. I saw the toll it took on Zara. It wasn't just the physical scars, but the weight of every life we couldn't save, including her own brother, finally confirmed among the Wraithwood's victims. There was a recklessness building in her, a willingness to take risks that made my gut clench with dread. Then came the mission that changed everything. A flurry of reports, a spike in activity. It wasn't the Yellowstone creature this time, but something similar, operating in the dense forests of the Pacific Northwest. We scrambled, a patchwork unit of agents, biologists, and even a grizzled anthropologist who muttered about old legends revived in the worst possible way. I watched Sara gear up, the familiar determination in her eyes now laced with something desperate. We shared a look, a silent acknowledgement that this might be the hunt that broke us. We tracked the creature for days, following a trail of eerily silent forests and the telltale signs of its passing, clawed trees, remnants of what used to be unfortunate hikers. We set up an ambush, an array of tech that felt laughably futile against the primal horror we were facing. We didn't have long to wait. It emerged from the undergrowth, a grotesque parody of nature. This one was bulkier than the Yellowstone Wraithwood, its mottled hide more stone than bark. It moved with a jarring, disjointed fluidity, its eyes pits of darkness fixated on us. It charged. Chaos erupted. Sensors screamed warnings, lights flashed, our net trap triggered early, snagging the creature in a tangle of high tensile wires. It roared in fury, the sound shaking the ground beneath our feet. Zara surged forward, driven by some reckless fury, firing a specialized round meant to disrupt the creature's camouflage. A single shot, echoing through the forest. Then silence. The creature froze, its form losing cohesion, patches of its form dissolving into smoke and swirling leaves. It let out a strangled, almost plaintive hiss, and then, in a blink, it was simply gone, vanished without a trace. A stunned silence descended upon the clearing. The relief, the disbelief, was swept away moments later as I realized Zara was missing. We searched frantically, spreading out through the woods, shouting her name. I stumbled upon her rifle, discarded and still warm, in a small hollow. Beyond it, the ground was churned up, littered with scraps of fabric, and blood. So much blood. The emptiness that opened up within me in that moment was worse than any fear I'd faced before. Zara was gone. Swallowed by the forest, taken by the shadows we hunted. They told me to take leave, to process what happened. The words felt hollow. There was no processing this, no analyzing my way out of the guilt and rage. The thing I learned, out there in those dark places, is that the world holds monsters beyond any campfire story. Some battles you don't win, you just survive. I haven't gone back to the task force. I don't know if I ever will. But I haven't turned my back on the darkness either. In seedy bars near trailheads, in online forums whispered about by those with haunted eyes, I seek information, rumors, anything about creatures like those that took Zara. The hunt has become a solitary one, fueled by a relentless need not for vengeance, but for some flicker of understanding in a world gone monstrous. The naive analyst I once was is gone, replaced by a man hardened by unseen battles. I've become one of the shadows, driven by the fading memory of a woman who dared to fight them.